One. We're going to launch that over there on the. Mic check. All right, crystal clear. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our friends online. It's great to see you. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. I'm waving at you, too. Um, my name is Councillor Brad Bradford. I'm the chair of the Toronto Music Advisory Committee. Uh, the committee secretary has confirmed that we have quorum, so we're good to go. We're going to call this meeting of TMAC to order and welcome everyone to our second meeting of the term, first of the year, halfway through February. And uh, I, I just can't overstate how nice it is to see all of you here today. Um, I see uh, we've got Deputy Mayor Morley here as well. And uh, Councillor Paul Ainsley is joining us uh, from Council also. And, uh, and I think we have regrets from some of our other Council colleagues. Um, so this meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting in Committee Room 2 at City Hall and using the City's WebEx technology with members and staff connected by video conferencing. Uh, or calling in. Members of the public are welcome to attend this meeting in person or remotely. Because we are meeting in part remotely, we ask for your patience on any delays and technical issues. And I would like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer questions or speak to the committee. If members would like to ask questions of staff or to speak, just let, uh, let me know, turn on your video and uh, I'll get a speaker's list going. If anyone is looking to place any motions today, um, please email the text of your motion to our committee secretary at tmac at toronto.ca. And when we're voting on an item, uh, I'd ask members to turn on the video and raise your hand to indicate your vote. If there's a recorded vote, we will, uh, we will call everybody individually and ask you to state uh, either in favor or opposed. I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement and that although we are in different locations, the Toronto Music Advisory Committee acknowledges the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, this is an opportunity for any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Uh, so I will ask if anyone has a declaration of interest to declare. Not seeing any in the room or online. Um, seeing none, I need to confirm the minutes. Uh, may I have a motion to confirm the, the minutes of our meeting on November 22nd? Deputy Mayor Morley. Um, all in favor? Carried. Very good. Um, we will now proceed. We've got six items on the table today on our agenda. Um, we're going to have some updates on our task teams, and uh, that is item MA 2.1. That's the first item. So. I'm going to maybe kind of go around, or actually Mike Tanner gonna cue us up on that and we'll go around and hear from everybody. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bradford. I, I thought I would just um, let people know who's, who's on deck, as it were, so there are no surprises and we can keep this as smooth and seamless as possible with the uh, task team updates. So uh, first we've got the venue health task team, which will be Sean Bowering. We'll follow that with the new space task team, that will be Johnny Bunce. Mm -hmm. Uh, followed by artist uh, health career development, that will be uh, Phoenix Pagliacci and Tanisha Richards. Followed by uh, artist affordable housing, which will be Charlotte Cornfield. Followed by general artist health, Julian Taylor online. Uh, advocacy and um, partnerships, that's Umer Jaffer here in the room. And finally, promotion and tourism, Sarah Jarvis. So um, keep in mind when you're up and um, Let's make this show sing, folks. <laughs> we start with Sean then? Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, good morning, all. Nice to see everybody here and online. 
Um, venue Health, uh, myself, uh, Tracy Jenkins, and Lisa Zbitnew. I always get that one wrong. Sorry, Lisa. Um, uh, we've hit the ground running. We've had a lot of meetings and engaging with people. So I'll kind of run through the list of what we're doing and what will be coming up uh, in the near future. So um, we, we've engaged with the new, new zoning and licensing for live music venues. We've had meetings with zoning and city planning um, just to get engagement because uh, January 1st, 2025, there will be some new uh, business licensing. Um, and we just want to make sure that, you know, all our, our music venues are uh, represented properly. Um, so there we've been engaging with city planning and municipal, municipal license and standards. Um, advise on uh, new requirements for LMVs association with recently approved changes to zoning, licensing, seek clarity on noise, crowd control plans, um, expanded activity, license cat expanded activity license categories. Um, there's a there's a, a bunch of uh, requirements that uh, um, that will be in place for venues above 150 um, and are open s several nights a week past midnight. And I, there was one other criteria that I don't recall right now. You recall that one, Mike? I don't remember, recall the third one. Um, but with those, you'll need a, a noise and a control plan. Um, we're hoping to make that a template system um, so it's very easy for all the venues to participate without um, having different you know, levels of, of change. Um, we're also uh, engaged on the insurance requirements, aligning with the new license and regulations as some um, smaller and newer venues have had difficulties over the past and uh, post-pandemic um, in uh, acquiring uh, insurance due to multiple things. Um, ongoing engagement with the noise bylaw review impacts outdoor events as well as bricks and mortar <coughs> venues so um, that is on um, we again another thing we've been uh, engaging in quite often and um, we'll, we'll hopefully see more results on that for the next meeting um, advise music office on new ongoing venue el eligibility for live music venue tax reduction program um, we're seeking out, and, and anyone can reach out to me <coughs> or anyone on the venue health team if you know of a new venue that you think would be um, uh, eligible for the tax reduction. It's quite substantial. It's a 50% reduction um, on your prop, uh, commercial property tax that uh, you're paying. So it's a, it's a very good program, and if you know anyone that's new um, that would be eligible, um, please advise, and we'll pass it on to the music office. Um, provide ongoing advice and content in the Good Neighbor Guide for late night businesses um, and also help uh, assist with the distribution. Um, this is something we've tried to practice at the Garrison. Uh, well, we haven't tried. We have practiced yeah. at the Garrison and the Baby G over the years, uh, uh, making note of your neighbors and being, being a good neighbor and doing some, in our case, we did some extra soundproofing and, uh, you know, we don't load out the back where... Uh, the back door where it's residential. So there's a bunch of, uh, you know, very good advice that would be shared through this uh, good neighbor guide for venues and just keeping in mind that we're all, you know, living in a big city on top of each other. And uh, some people go to bed at nine o'clock, I heard. It was weird, but. Um, um, and we, we, uh, we are working toward uh, expanding the live music passport program. And we did have a great meeting with Destination Toronto yesterday, two hours ago, anyway. Um, and, and so the ball's rolling there and uh, there's some good ideas. So that's, uh, uh, was fairly new on the list, but uh, uh, um, a good engaging meeting that uh, some Ideas were shared and will be moved on. Um, long term, explore the potential long term strategies to preserve L LMVs. Um, some expected to overlap with new space tag team, heritage conservation, international conventions such as Borough Charter and UNESCO, innovations like San Francisco's Legacy Business Program. Um, that's an interesting one that Mike had brought to us. Uh, um, that we've had a quick look at where the city of San Francisco supports um, legacy businesses and, and there's tax reductions and uh, engagement with landlords to make sure there's uh, 
um, these legacy businesses stay um, ongoing and, and vital. So that's something that we might be able to apply to music uh, venues um, because uh, commercial tenancy is uh, always a tricky one. Um, asset purchase strategies as that of the Music Trust. Music Trust is a program in London where um, a bunch of professionals uh, involved or adjacent to the uh, live music industry have raised funds to purchase properties um, in the hopes of saving uh, live mu music venues. Um, so uh, with a long-term ongoing, um, you know, ownership is very important. Um, and it, it, it's been quite successful, um, the fundraising, and so we're, we're, we're going to explore that avenue for Toronto and see if it is a viable um, opportunity. Um, um, partnerships with private sector developers, including those involving social enterprise partners, that would almost go in hand in hand with, our, with the last uh, comment. Um, community land trusts, um, again, that's very similar. Uh, minimi minimizing impacts of di displacement for venues affected by the Ontario line. Um, the Ontario line is going along Queen Street. There's the Rex, there's the Rivoli, there's the Horseshoe, there's uh, the Cameron House. They're, uh, they're going to have a giant subway being built under them, underneath them and, um, you know, at the corner of Spadina and Queen. So, um, it, if it's anything like uh, Eglinton, the impact will be great, and we want to do whatever we can city-wise. It is, an, is it, it is an, um, a provincial project, but um, anything, any any displacement, any you know interruption of business, we're trying to foresee and keep to a minimum. Um, it's a very busy strip along there, so it's uh, pretty important for the venue health uh, sector. Um, and last but not least, uh, continue to advocate for insurance issues. Um, insurance uh, post-pandemic went up about three to four hundred percent. We've tried to engage um, on multiple levels with the Ontario government because it is an Ontario um, legislative issue. Um, currently, there is no. Um, um, bounds and boundaries for commercial um, insurance. Uh, it is, um, we, we were basically, most venues, all venues, were told, Here, here's the price, pay it or don't. Um, and it's put a lot of people in a tricky spot. Um, um, so that's, that's a high priority, but again, we're gonna probably have to engage some of the councillors and city, city hall to uh, um, engage with uh, the Ontario government. Um, um, and I think that's uh, what we've, uh, like I said, hit the hit the ground running, and that that's uh, um, that'll do it for now. If there's any questions, no. Any questions for Sean online on menu health? Okay, is that good? It was very comprehensive. Uh, Sean, uh, Lisa, Tracy, thanks for, for all your work on that. That's a, that's a lot of important stuff for everybody, so appreciate the update. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think we'll do new space. Johnny? Johnny? Yeah. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Councillor Radford. Now we are in business. Um, <clears throat> I'm representing New Space along, <clears throat> excuse me, alongside uh, Chris and Gelfand, Amir Jafar, Jeremy Keston, John Kiru, Hila Omar Kail, and Benjamin Valcat. And we've um, broken our work into sort of three uh, short and midterm priorities. The first one uh, crossed over a bit with what Sean already talked about in the venue health um, task team, and that's intangible cultural heritage. Um, and we're looking at exploring, exploring the feasibility of longer term st potential strategies for protecting intangible cultural heritage, which really means the sort of invisible uses of cultural space. And often that's music and other, the, the, the programming, what's happening on stage, the, the communities that are developing these spaces. Um, so this can include existing live music venues, rehearsal and recording studios, and other bricks and mortar assets, and things that, spaces that may not be currently be protected by the Ontario Heritage Act. 
Um, some of these explorations could include international conventions like Australia's Burra Charter or UNESCO. Um, Sean mentioned uh, US-based innovations like San Francisco's Legacy Business Program. Um, Really interesting asset purchase strategies. Sean also, Sean also mentioned, like the Music Venue Trust in the UK and their own our own venues, own our venues um, campaign, which was a really successful initiative based around community sh shares. And on a similar topic, community land trusts, which are nonprofit corporations that ensure property becomes perpetually affordable. And though uh, CLTs are traditionally aimed at providing affordable housing, uh, there's been growing interest in creating land trusts for cultural space, cultural land trusts. Uh, uh, and there's uh, one right here in Toronto, uh, which is the Community and Cultural Spaces Trust in the Bloor and Dufferin area. Uh, the next priority is development. Um, we'd like to engage with city planning staff and private sector developers to explore how community benefits charges, which are formerly Section 37 funds, might be able to help secure cultural space and new developments. Uh, we're interested in creating a guide for developers on how to engage with the city to incorporate cultural space within new developments. Um, and building on the success of the It's OK Studio at 468 Queen West, uh, we'd like to engage with CREM, Corporate Real Estate Management, and create TO staff to assist with ongoing work to identify suitable city-owned space for lease for grassroots music organizations for performance and venue space, and also music rehearsal facility operator. Action coming directly out of this last priority is that the nonprofit organization that I re represent, Wavelength Music, we're planning to submit a Canada Council seed grant application to, to support this research uh, work this spring and summer if we're successful with that grant. Um, and uh, lastly, um, we've also, our last third priority is outdoor space, and we'd like to help city and the music sector grow and maximize opportunities for using outdoor space, such as parks and patio, uh, parks and patios for live music. Um, so we're looking to engage with the park staff to explore the possibility for reducing costs for outdoor event producers in city parks, and exploring opportunities to use other city space, such as exhibition place, that are not operated by PFR. Parks, Forestry, and Recreation. Um, and uh, you can learn more uh, about some of these priorities in a report that I co-authored called Reimagining Music Venues. Um, this is ongoing work my organization, Wavelength, is doing with the University of Toronto School of Cities and Department of Sociology, and it crosses over a lot with the work of this task team. And you can download, download it at the link uh, or on screen or use the QR code. Um, it's, uh, if you visit wavelengthmusic.ca, please visit the, the tab called Research, and you can download the report. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you. That's a great, uh, great update, Johnny. Lots of work going on there with you and the team. Any questions? So I was just, I was saying. Right. We'll circulate for, for folks online. We'll circulate that so everyone can uh, get access to the, the resource and the work that's underway there. Uh, with, it's with U of T? It's, yeah, it's a collaboration between Wavelength and the University of Toronto. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. I was just saying um, to Mike here in terms of setting up some of those meetings and just making sure that we have an opportunity to get around the table with some of those key staff, create mm -hmm. CREM, planning on the CBC stuff, um, we're going to all work together to actually get those on the books so that we can have those conversations because I think that's important stuff to push the stuff from this uh, task team forward. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, just, just to additionally, um, I can uh, connect you guys in, in your group and with the venue health group with um, Music Venues Trust in UK that's run by Mark David, who's a friend of mine and uh, rep colleague, associate. Um, so I can set that up. And also, I think we talked about this with these groups internally, um, maybe talking to somebody like Kevin Barrett with uh, Kensington Market Land Trust, Community Land Trust would be a good start because they've done some good work there in preserving, you know, uh, grassroots space. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions? Looking online? Hey, Good. It's Phoenix online. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Phoenix. Floor is over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, great presentation. I had a question in regards to the It's OK space and any other options that are being um, currently explored by the city. Do we know of any other 
facilities, that space that are being um, offered to uh, to artists on a temporary basis? Um, I can give a quick answer to that, uh, Phoenix. Uh, it's Mike Tanner. Uh, the answer is no. Um, that's the short answer. Um, but the longer answer is that both corporate real estate management, CREM, and CREATEO uh, are aware of this council direction to look for city-owned space, uh, suitable city-owned space for below market rate lease to both uh, folks like It's Okay Community Arts for performance space and also for uh, people who are uh, operating or could operate um, music rehearsal facilities as well. I mean, there are t two slightly different typologies there, as you can appreciate, with respect to what the space would look like, where it would be, how big it would need to be, proximity to transit, distance from residential, whether parking's Im important or not, that kind of thing. So there are conversations ongoing with corporate real estate management who manage all of the city's real estate portfolio, and with CREATEO, who tend to get involved when any of those properties are transitioning in, in any way. Um, but, but I think part of what my sense, and, and Councillor Bradford just echoed that, that, that TMAC can do is really help add um, some urgency and some emphasis and some specificity to those conversations. Um, so, so this group that just presented, uh, I think, might be key in that, really looking at new space, new ways to present um, music, new, new hubs, uh, replications and, and um, new iterations of the successes that we've seen at 468 Queen West with It's OK. Uh, so ongoing conversation, we want to add more um, emphasis to those conversations. Mike, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Could I just quickly follow on to Phoenix's question and, and Mike's answer just very, very quickly? It's Marguerite Pickett speaking. Um, I would just add that um, in economic development and culture, there's an office called the Office for Creative Space. Um, that's dealing with a lot of these issues as well. And in the culture plan and the economic action plan, but really more the culture plan that's currently under development, um, with economic development and culture, and which there's been a lot of outreach to this community for, for input, space and of it, access to space is a huge emphasis there too. So there's a way in which economic development and culture, the division that houses the music office, can actually work collectively across multiple interests to even strengthen and expedite the work in this space. Questions there? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go Kim and then Sarah. Um, Mike, you're probably aware of this, but Massey Hall and Harborfront also have spaces that could be put to use, I think. I don't know if that would fall under this specific category, because I guess you're looking for new spaces, but um, has City of Toronto already looked at partnering with either of those places? Um, we, we've had ongoing discussions, thanks Kim for bringing that up, uh, with both uh, Massey Allied Music Centre um, and, and Harborfront. Um, more though um, around actually opening the doors of those Hollywood institutions on a, on a kind of a one-off basis for presenters looking for new and unusual spaces to present work rather than long-term um, occupancy, you know, sort of two years and up, uh, of any particular space within either Allied Music Center or Harborfront. Um, so it's more been about sort of getting um, grassroots music organizations in through the doors and looking at the different spaces and places at Harborfront, at Allied Music Center and saying, well, here's, here's what you get, here are the rates, here's how the institution could help you promote your event, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe if you have information about sort of more longer term arrangements that might be um, struck we could talk about that offline. And we, we certainly are constantly talking with both both those institutions. So if there's something we can do to take the conversation in those directions, we're all ears. Thanks. Great. Yeah. And actually I was I was thinking more about the studio spaces right, as opposed right, right. to the library. 
Yep. No. No. All. All. All very worthwhile. And and I'll be honest that that part has sort of s slipped my mind a little bit. Thanks, Kim. Jump over to Sarah. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, bring we'll to Sarah. the group's awareness, if you weren't already aware, um, TAPA, uh, the Theater uh, Dance and Opera Association, um, has opened a space called B Street. Now, the intended audience is the arts community. However, they have opened it up to individual memberships for musicians to come in and rent that space. There's a rehearsal space, a recording studio, very small, nimble space. It's not a proper studio, but it does have functionality there. Um, it's very affordable, and it's something to, to also put on the radar. Is that the place down in Bloor West? No, uh, it's um, DuPont and Bathurst. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. He'll follow up with. And I think memberships are like sixty bucks a year. Uh, I had a little back and forth with Jacoba yeah. about that. I'll follow up on that. Thank you. Question? Comment? Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank you for sharing, and I was curious how you were thinking about um, how some of these new spaces might be leveraged as um, multi-use, multi-purpose, multidisciplinary spaces, maybe even sometimes outside of the vantage of what we consider in the kind of ballpark of music and arts and culture more broadly. And I'm thinking of it because um, I'm currently working on a symposium at the Faculty of Information um, as part of my fellowship and we're hosting some of it at It's OK Space, and it's a symposium on um, black art and technology, and I, I, I think about how oftentimes those connections are made interpersonally, and I wonder how in this initial stage of building and conceiving and visioning, we can really think about um, the many other groups in the city who are doing work that's aligned with ours, but oftentimes might not be top of mind. That's a great question, Melissa. I think with this uh, with this study that we're envisioning, this environmental scan and needs assessment, is finding out who is out there that we might not know about, that we might not, not be connected to. I think in one meeting, um, Mike and I called it silo syndrome, which seems very much uh, something that is a challenge within the Toronto arts community. And because it is such a wide and diverse community, is uh, finding out what are the intersections with music, with other art forms, and who are other uh, uh, other groups and potential users that are that are seeking space and that, are, that might be looking to, to to connect to band together to create some kind of a collective space. So I think that that's really would be an aim of that uh, environmental scan and needs assessment would be to cast the net as wide as possible um, through a survey, probably initially a survey and and a series of focus groups to really bring in as many people as possible that might want to. Uh, tell us what they're looking for and, and, and bring their vision to the table. Thanks, Melissa. Any other questions, comments? Good. Well, appreciate that update. No one online? We all good on there? Okay, uh, then we're going to jump online for our next update. This is Artist Health. Um, Phoenix and Tanisha are both online. And I will turn it over to uh, the two of you. Thank you, Brad. Um, so the Artist Health team has had some conversation about uh, what we wish to see and uh, how we wish to proceed in terms of career development for artists in the city. Um, I'm just, uh, slide two, I'll just say the slide number because I there's a little bit of glare on my end, but um, the artist, oh, that's perfect. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so I'm still seeing the artist's health, uh, the initial page. Is it on the next page yet? Yeah, hang, hang on a sec, Phoenix. We're just trying to okay. work through that. We've advanced it on our screen, but it's not showing up on on your screen. So just uh, one second here. Wow, is that a new Broadcast Toronto logo? I've never seen that before. That was some retro vibes. That was pretty cool. Yeah. If it's easier, I can just um, call out the slide number 
Uh, if you guys are seeing it on your end, that's fine. We actually just got it up. We've, we're on the, the slide that says priority number one. Oh. Uh, we'll go to slide, slide two. Okay, back one, slide two. Yep, there we go. Over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, so the Artist Health Career Development Team has identified a number of priorities, I should say a number of priorities, <laughs> that will help to develop the careers of local artists across the city. So on our next slide. Priority one is bringing awareness. Um, we've analyzed with the assistance of the music office um, a list of uh, existing training courses and opportunities for artists in the city. And uh, there's that word again. We talked about siloed initiatives and how we can look to connect those silos and actually make an entire community. Um, we also work with the music office to identify some suitable venues across the city and recognize them for their different, uh, unique uh, abilities to bring these opportunities to participants. So we looked at accessibility, um, we looked at capacity numbers for these venues, and when considering how to provide these resources to artists, um, we kind of looked at how these can assist with that silo effect. Some of the solutions uh, that we focused on were, um, as mentioned, ex creating that extensive list, and not just of um, music professionals and developments, but also of the resources that are, already exist and gathering those and making sure that they have the most up-to-date information. This list is available to us. However, we want to somehow make it available publicly, make it available to individuals who might be struggling to find the perfect venue for their um, event or just be struggling to find out how they can proceed from recorded sound and into live sound within their city. Next slide. Priority number two is collaboration and integration. So taking this information that we have about these various opportunities and abilities across the city and actually providing them to the artists in our city. Um, what we recognize when doing this is that there are already some established, well-known industry organizations that focus on both general and targeted information and ability of providing that information to these communities. So we're very fortunate here in Toronto. We don't exactly have a lack of resources. Um, we don't exactly have a lack of organizations that are able to take on these tasks. So what we decided was it's more important to identify these industry partners that already exist and collaborate with them to provide the work workshops that either they're already providing or the workshops that we find are kind of more geared towards a niche audience. Um, I know in previous meetings we mentioned certain genres that aren't recognized within the city. Um, and so bringing the attention to those groups by using organizations such as, for example, these industry partners that I have here on the on the right of the of the slide that focus on both general information and resources, as well as specified for identified groups, such as Indigenous persons, LGBTQ, LGB2, yeah, should know this, LGBTQ2 plus community, um, as well as specific uh, special, I guess, special interest groups, women, um, Black Canadians, and the likes. Next slide, please. Priority number three has been recognized as expansion and exploration. So once we have identified and collaborated, we want to build. We want to continue to make sure that these aren't one-off opportunities that, um, you know, somebody has mentioned in past. And when you hear about it again, you're like, hey, yeah, I heard about that. We really do want to focus on the advancement of the careers of artists in this city um, and the advancement of creativity because eventually we want it to become an economic uh, benefit for the city. Um, so through networking and especially, uh, sorry, especially extensive networking, connecting with industry professionals across industries, um, we can bring the idea that music is um, intersectional with these other industries that are already building on Toronto's economy. The main question that we were focusing on uh, when we discussed this was how can we help artists' communities to know they have community? And so that's kind of the forefront as we proceed with these events. Um, you can skip the next slide. It's my awesome networking event idea, but we will come back to that another time. Um, the objective of such networking events are to help these industry professionals and budding industry um, artists and creatives to find their ideal network. We know 
that not every network is for us. Not everybody is at the same level at the same time. And so um, finding their ideal network can really help them to not be discouraged and to proceed in arts and creation. Um, I also feel that a lot of people in the city are a little inundated with organizations, committees, groups, um, things of that nature. So a lot of artists might not really understand what TMAC is, who we are, how they can benefit from um, communicating with us. And I think that that should be our main focus, introducing um, ourselves to the artist community in 2024. Um, and again, these collaborations can be across organizations that already have established networks and can just bring their people to our people. And that is how we build community. Um, and then I just have some notes there that are irrelevant at this time. <laughs> Next slide, please. So our action items right now are to develop a detailed plan for executing a comprehensive. Oh, I'm so sorry. Now this is when we go over to Tanisha. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so the next steps and action items for us are to develop a detailed plan, um, identify specific areas of skill development needs for artists and grassroots music entrepreneurs, and define clear goals and milestones for the program's execution. Um, we will detail targeted workshops, training sessions, or courses to address identify skill gaps, and then incorporate a timeline for the implementation of skill development activities. Uh, for partnerships and mentorship. Um, proactively, we'll establish and identify potential organizations offering business skill training, initiate conversations and agreements to form collaborative partnerships, and then identify experienced professionals in the music industry that can support um, our groups. And then next slide. Um, networking implementation. Uh, we'll choose suitable platforms for artists and entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate, ensure user-friendly features and accessibility, um, plan the events um, with engaging activities, panels, and opportunities to participate um, for participants to network organically, which is super important for us, um, and then promote the event through various channels to maximize its attendance. And then lastly, marketing and exposure executing strategies for effective online presence. We wanna make sure, like Phoenix had mentioned, that um, it's not something that people hear once it's done, they hear it before it happens. Um, so we wanna develop a content strategy for social media and other online channels and utilize digital marketing techniques to enhance visibility, establish partnerships as well within the community to ensure that um, it's reaching the folks that we want it to reach and then collaborate on marketing initiatives to broaden the reach and opportunities provided by the program in conjunction with the music office. That's it. Thanks very much. Uh, lots of great things for us to all work on. That was wonderful. Uh, any questions? Looking in the room here, anyone online? Uh, probably a couple comments. Uh, Mike Tanner, over to you. Yeah, just a quick one. Thank you, uh, Phoenix and Tanisha. That was that was great and really inspiring as well. Um, I just want to put it out there that that um, we in in the music office, in film and entertainment industries, and in economic development and culture generally, are totally down to support this idea of bringing people together and networking and, and sort of overcoming those silos. Marguerite oversees a section that includes other adjacent creative industries, and TMAC members here, as we know, represent all these different components within the industry. So if we work together, as um, Phoenix and Tanisha and, and the others in this group have, have suggested that we do, um, I know Councillor Bradford's also very keen on this idea of, of networking event or a series of networking events that just kind of help break down those barriers. So we'll connect with you guys separately afterwards about what what the next steps can be. And and I, I'd love to get something in the books for, for this spring, you know, like not, not wait too long to get, get the ball rolling on this. It seems like an easy one and one that would generate a lot of other um, great ideas as well. Yeah, that was that was my comment as well. Is like let's just uh, let's see if we can go on that. So that's something for all of us to work on and try and land it. I think those were a bunch of great ideas, but getting together would be a be a nice one. Sean has a comment. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was great. 
Uh, I'll offer up the garrison as a, the first one if we want to get rolling. Uh, years ago, Mike and I did a Music City um, uh, presentation uh, open to the public. Uh, it was very, very well engaged. Uh, there were some pitchforks and burning brooms, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but that's all it. part of the process. But um, uh, it, it reminded me of that, and it, and it was actually really engaging, and it was great, and there was, you know, some stuff brought to us that we wasn't, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in front of us before. So um, offer it up, uh, want to reach out, and we'll set up our first uh, event. Beautiful. Wonderful. Any other questions, comments? All good? Okay, thank you so much, Phoenix. Tanisha, appreciate that. We're going to jump to... Charlotte in the room here. Cool. So, Are you doing affordable housing? Yeah. For music? Yes. Oh, awesome. Very good. Yeah. So Over to you. Our, our task team is Johnny and Gila and myself. Um, and we are working to help develop recommendations and required characteristics of housing options for artists, as well as cultural spaces and rehearsal spaces in, integrated into these um, <coughs> buildings. So our priorities are to source information and studies on the economic and cultural impacts of musicians leaving the city. Obviously, this is happening in Toronto in a big way. So if we have some hard data on what happens to a city when artists start leaving it, then it kind of like helps our cause a little bit. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we're working on is compiling a list of groups and individuals all already working on this goal, just so that we're all on the same page. We can all share information. We can all kind of work together on this. Um, <clears throat> Mike has connected us with the Housing Secretariat staff and we're going to meet with them to discuss. And we're also exploring opportunities to secure affordable housing via community land trust. So we want to meet with Kevin Barrett from the Kensington Market Land Trust and just get some more information. Um, and we're also researching musician and performing arts housing that already exists in the city, just to find out a little bit more about um, how these models are working here already. Um, one of the examples is Performing Arts Lodge down on <coughs> near St. Lawrence Market, which has, I believe, 750 units, and two-thirds of them are rent geared to income housing for aging performing artists. And then our last priority is to research the multi-unit residential acquisition program um, that already exists within this, in the city and see if we could, um, with an external partner, could this be applied to musician housing? So that's where we're at so far. Thank you. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, did you say you've met with Housing Secretariat already? Um, Mike meeting? just connected us with them, so we're going to set up a meeting. Okay. Keep us posted on that. I wouldn't, uh, I'm sure. Lots of people would want to hear how that goes. Um, appreciate you doing that. That's a great initiative. Any other questions for Charlotte and the team? Looking online. Okay. Very good. Thank you for the update. I appreciate that. I, uh, is this our... Julian Taylor. Julian's doing general advocacy here. Julian joins us online. Um, Julian, how are you? Over to you. Oh, can you hear me? We got gotcha. you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm well. How's everybody else doing? Excellent. We're doing okay, great. So, well, We're our, doing our, great and happy to okay. hear, hear from you. <laughs> Good, Julian. Excellent. We've got a tiny little task force team here, but we have sat down and talked about certain things in the music sector for musicians and music workers that we find a lot of holes in. Uh, we want to make sure that there is uh, support for musicians and workers from a mental health perspective. And all of us find that there's really not a clear uh, definition or useful support for musicians at the moment. SEMA has just created something which is wonderful, um, but most workers and musicians don't have uh, access to benefits. Um, so we wanna make sure that there are ways to access programs for people in the music sector um, that they can 
you know, have funding for help, things like that. We want to try to also uh, bridge the gap with some of uh, potential partners like Unison, um, TMA. Of course, we've reached out to them. Even, um, you know, uh, the others, people like Factor, and, and find out where there's uh, even MH is another one that came up. We want to talk to people like that about trying to bridge programs for musicians and for people working in the music industry here in Toronto. That's really about it, trying to build long-term partnerships. Um, also, the affordable housing was mentioned, um, of course, and we know that there's a cast team doing that. So, yeah, that's the update from our group. Thank you so much, Julian. And I'm going to take a moment here uh, just to acknowledge and congratulate uh, Julian, as many of us know, was Contemporary Roots Artist of the Year nominee uh, for a Juno. Uh, you don't have to say it. Hey, love it. And uh, we're you. all rooting Seriously. for you um, next month in, in Halifax. Um, you're making us all <laughs> proud. So are you in Vancouver right now? I'm on the West Coast, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. So thanks for getting up real early. Uh, and then you're going to be on the other coast next month, uh, hopefully to take home the hardware. So congratulations. Uh, any questions, comments for, for Julian? Okay, good. Thank you so much. And uh, again, we're all, we're all rooting for you and uh, making Toronto and East York proud. Congratulations. One quick comment here. Mike's got a comment. Yeah, just uh, th thanks, thanks, Julian. I just want to mention, um, in case it wasn't apparent, that this particular task team subgroup uh, is very small. It's it's Julian and Bridget Fry. So two artists, two busy working artists. Uh, all of you are also busy with whatever you're doing, some other artists in the room as well. I was just going to suggest that uh, as this task team uh, goes about its business, starting to do some of this research, looking at other potential assistance for artists around things like insurance, mental health programs, affordable housing, um, it would be great, particularly I think with this group, if they engage with other TMAC members to help with that kind of thing. Some of you folks will be aware of resources or have connections or know people people who are maybe working in these areas. So um, contact me, uh, certainly contact Bridget and, and Julian, and, and let's see if we can move the ball down the field a little bit. We've got a couple of meetings set up already, but uh, we'll be looking to the rest of the people on the committee for some help with that. Thanks. Awesome. Very good. Thanks for all the hard work on that. Thanks, Julian. Um, we're going to jump to general industry health. We've, uh, it's a big, big crew, but we've got Umer here in the room uh, to speak to that. Over to you, sir. Right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Omer, and under the general uh, group, we are actually working towards advocacy and partnerships. Uh, this group consists of Paul, uh, Johnny, uh, Jeremy, John Kiru, Kim Temple, and Jamal Wickers. And it's a, it's a new task team. Actually, I should pause first and thank Mike and Jacqueline for organizing all of us and for all these task teams. Uh, I think it's pretty evident by all the presentations that there's a lot of overlap, but really the goal is how we can break down into smaller groups and collectively work towards uh, the goals uh, set out for TMAC. Um, so for this task team, there's a lot of overlap, but essentially advocacy and partnership is the main theme here. Uh, what that means for us, uh, we're still developing um, further action items, but um, at the top level on the advocacy front, how can we be the collective voice for the music industry um, of Toronto and for this committee and work with other level, levels of government uh, and be the local point of contact as uh, CLMA or SEMA are doing their uh, wonderful advocacy work, how can we be their point of contact here in Toronto and channel all the different perspectives um, through um, to them. Um, that being the main advocacy part, uh, internally at the city level, how we can partner with the music office and work with other city departments, uh, such as business growth services, uh, the BEIA office, uh, 
um, how um, we can help towards integration of uh, music into city planning. And really the push is music not being an afterthought, but being part of the planning process as early as possible. You've got a great resource through TMAC. Uh, a lot of people can give inputs. And if we really are to build a city uh, which keeps music uh, in the core, then we should be involved um, as early as possible through um, the planning process of the city. Uh, also connecting with uh, tourism and um, uh, promoting uh, Toronto as a destination. There are ideas like you know the celebrity ambassadors concept that's been done um, in other parts, and uh, partnering with local ecosystems. Uh, other groups have talked about this: uh, venues, studios, services available for artists. And on that note, I think uh, a networking event that was being talked about earlier would be amazing. That really brings us all together, and we can talk about um, opportunities and overlaps between uh, TMAC and the sector, uh, the ecosystem on the whole. Um, more towards uh, some uh, short-term practical stuff uh, that's come up is around licenses and tariffs. And we are looking at following up with uh, licensing for city venues. This obviously will be talking to the venues groups as well, uh, how we can use community centers, parks, libraries, uh, but that might not yet be covered under some uh, licenses from the city. Another great idea that's come up is implementing of um, tech infrastructure and tools that help uh, one such tool that's been implemented in Europe is called uh, Kuvo. I don't know how to pronounce it. Kuvo, yeah? Okay. Well, it's a cool software that you can just essentially plug in to your DJ system in your venue, and that allows you to skip those uh, SOCAN forms that everyone has to fill. Uh, it does it automatically, which then allows artists and songwriters and everyone else to get the right royalties. So there are technologies out there that are successfully being implemented in other parts of the world, how we can bring that into our city and our ecosystem such that everyone benefits. Um, so there, this is essentially sort of a summary of all that we're looking at, partnerships and advocacy. Uh, and the request is that if there are advocacy concerns or uh, opportunities and partnership opportunities that come to you, you can throw that to this task team and we'll hopefully rile up and uh, get things going. Thank you. Thanks for the updated, Mayor. Any, uh, any questions? Again, a small comment here. Comment from Mike? Sorry, I don't mean to be diving in all the time here, but uh, th thanks, Mayor. A uh, couple of quick things there. Um, we can help right away with the continuing that conversation that started in the last term of TMAC about ensuring that all city-owned properties um, are appropriately licensed. Um, we have great connections, Jacqueline particularly, with um, TPL, with uh, city-owned performance spaces through Parks, Forestry and Rec. We can get to you know the community centers and things like that. So let's, let's follow up on that. Um, separately, uh, we we did a bit of that work last term, as I say, and we can we can continue it here. Um, and uh, I think it would be a good idea to connect for you guys with the venue health group on the uh, you know exploring that Kuvo conversation. Yeah. Sort of seeing yeah. with some venue operators and, and a network of venue operators, um, how how smooth is the path to implementing or exploring that? Yeah, makes sense. I have a question about that too. Over to you. It's Kim Temple. Yep, over to Thanks. you. Um, Kuvo sounds pretty exciting, obviously, as a music publisher who represents songwriters. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and see if you're, how does that integrate with SOCAN? Does that reporting create playlists that then are ingested by SOCAN? Instead of filling out, I, I hear you on the laborious filling out the SOCAN forms front, but I'm just curious to know how Kuva would integrate. Yeah, I think Jeremy knows more about this. Um, I don't know if he's here online. Hello, can you, can you hear me? There you go. We got you, Hello. Jeremy. All right, yeah, so um, yeah, it's something I've been investigating. Um, how it exactly works, uh, with the, the submitting of the form so uh, yes they they partner with socan to uh you know, to to 
receive the information. Um, it's something that you they they when they work with other countries, um, they started a pilot project uh, that collected data and then shown it to their agency, their local uh, national agencies, and uh, created a plan to uh, to make that work. Um, so we would that's what we would do here if if we were going to try this, we would do a pilot with a few venues and then present that data to uh, SoCan to see if it's something that they'd be interested in. And then if that works, then it's something I could roll out to a larger group. And uh, so that would be maybe how that might work. Um, but yes, they collect the data and uh, report it to SOCAN. Uh, That's great. Yeah. Thanks. And if you need help, um, you know, connecting with SOCAN, let me know. We can work on that together in our task force. That'd be great. Yeah. Question or comment from Melissa? Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. And um, I think it's always exciting to think about some new ways we can resource our ecosystem, which uh, makes me think of maybe a broader question around how this committee has dealt with and considered um, larger questions just related to this group's relationship to uh, the tech sector in general, especially considering a, concent a concentration of um, international music tech companies that are situated in the city, and how we have felt in the past about um, developing a set of guidelines or just really thinking deeply about what it means for some of those groups to be working within the city, impacting the ecosystem in a lot of really um, significant and material ways, while also thinking about um, a sort of global set of trend forecasting and ways we can really be prepared and mindful of what we can predict based on things happening in other cities and countries similarly situated to us. Um, you, you were looking over in my direction <laughs> <laughs> while you were uh, framing your question, Melissa. Um, the, uh, the short answer to your question is there hasn't been a lot of work done in that area, and one of the reasons for that is that um, until this iteration of TMEC, we actually haven't had a lot of members who are well versed in or steeped in or connected to the tech sector uh, in the way that you are and that several other members on the, on the committee are now. Uh, so I think the time is ripe also with um, work being done at the federal level uh, around you know guidelines and regulations and scoping out the path forward for the way some of the tech uh, companies work with the creative sector, this is a great time to be having those conversations. I think the way I would see it would be if there are people on this committee who uh, want to start looking at some um, you know, guidelines or principles, uh, guiding principles maybe, uh, for, for how that tech sector could work with the music sector, um, that would be a great place to start. And then we could look at where where that information, where that insight should, should go. Is it city? Is it city advocating to other levels of government? What exactly is the path? But starting with some expert um, and informed ideas uh, here would be uh, entirely appropriate, I think. Do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I, thanks, Mike. I would say given where conversations about Bill C-11 are right now, um, I think, and given that this exists at the federal level, I think SEMA and CLMA have been doing some very effective interventions um, to Heritage and to the CRTC. So rather than starting from zero, I'd say let's look at what they're doing and see if uh, individuals or groups um, separate from TMAC actually want to support, to amplify um, what's already happening at the federal level. Because I think it's, it's quite advanced and there's already advocacy that's happening. So I'd say that I, I would just add that one point to answer the meta part of your question. Mm -hmm. And then the part of your question that was less meta, I think, refers to uh, something that's been mentioned here today before, melting the silos and bringing sectors together, which is something, you know, film and entertainment industries includes the Office of Creative Technology. Um, and unfortunately, our key staff member is, is off right now for a number of weeks. Um, so that slowed down some of the work that is actually slated in the work plan for this year on exactly this initiative, partnering with Mike and others. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the comments. Anybody else? 
All right. Well, that's uh, that's great. That's very helpful. Uh, we're going to move to our last task team update promotion and tourism. Um, bunch of folks online here from this, and we have Sarah Jarvis in the room to give us the update. Thank you. Um, we've got the two powerhouse Melissa's on this group, one to my left, Melissa Vincent in the room also, and Chris and Melissa Bob Clark online. Uh, so um, we, we gathered together and struggled a little bit with the notion of promotion and amplifying messaging and who exactly are we promoting, what are we promoting, and to whom? Um, because it really touches on industry promotion, B2B, as well as audience promotion. That's a massive job. <laughs> so we tried to break it down a little bit so that it was something that we could hopefully achieve. Uh, so overarching goal would be to strengthen Toronto's music ecosystem to enhance Toronto's standing as a music destination. Uh, a number of different objectives in order to uh, achieve that goal. One would be strengthen Toronto's position uh, by forming strategic alliances to leverage existing promotional engines to better position music offerings in Toronto. This is an ongoing theme throughout all of our presentations about uh, forming those partnerships and, and allegiances, um, but specifically uh, collaborate with the city's um, visitor economy office, shout out to that team who's in the room, uh, to explore opportunities to enhance music tourism, building Toronto's reputation as a year-round music destination. In Engage Destination Toronto, I might know some people there, to help promote the music ecosystem and events. Um, I would like to just mention that Destination Toronto is just now beginning the process of executing a, a new tourism master plan. And when I say new, uh, it's the first one. Um, so uh, we will ensure that the music industry is considered and consulted as part of that long-term sustainable tourism strategy and action plan. Uh, it's, it's already sort of anticipated that, that they will have a seat at the table, we will have a seat at the table. Um, and engage Destination Ontario also to help promote music experiences and events. And uh, work with our friend John at Tabia to ensure that we're connecting to all of the BIAs as well. Uh, next up, support efforts for audience development uh, by identifying and supporting promotion of music sector and events. So explore innovative promotional strategies, leveraging those emerging social platforms and technologies, uh, connecting with the advocacy and partnership team on that celebrity ambassador initiative and what that might look like. Support our friends in the venue health team uh, to support the music passport initiative, which we've already talked about. Uh, and. Um, this is a bit of a hot topic, build a more cohesive um, community around music listings or channels for expert voices to supply information and generate enthusiasm for events at smaller venues uh, and events featuring lesser known artists. Um, there's certainly lots that exist. We all, we've talked about it before, the loss of the paper uh, and listings. Um, Johnny knows <laughs> about this very well, uh, but uh, re-engaging with, with those new online platforms to, to better support that community, like Now Toronto, Now Playing Toronto, Destination Toronto, Next Mag, et cetera. Next up, empower and enable more cohesiveness in the community, again, an ongoing theme for all of us to strengthen and foster new relationships within the industry and between different community groups operating at multiple levels. So we need to identify what those connective tissues are between organizations and existing infrastructure, engage industry groups and partners invested in the same projects, define the needs of other groups in an interest to operate from the perspective of interconnectedness. It's not clear to us exactly what that is right now, so we need to figure that out. Um, Explore the value of enhancing the landing page at TMAC. Is that the place to have information to try and promote and, and connect? Um, so uh, is there opportunity for potential collaborations and features of the voices of those who operate within different sectors of the community through that platform? 
Um, and finally, amplify the work of the Music Office and TMAC to ensure the industry is better informed and connected to music-related initiatives. Develop a list of industry networks and channels to leverage to amplify those communications. Also, assess and survey the community to find what those best channels are for communicating to meet the needs of the community on topics like the recent regulatory changes to help animate new areas for music activity, the Good Neighbor Guide, and all of the city's music-related initiatives consultations and meetings. Very good, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the team? Looking online, I see Kim Temple. Kim, over to you. I, I love everything you just said, Sarah. I'm wondering about uh, the export piece of this, which is really yep. spreading global awareness of what's happening in Toronto. And I I can't remember where I was, but in one of my travels recently, I was at an airport that had a QR code you could scan. So when you land in that city, you can see what's on, what's who's playing, uh, things to do, you know, while you're there visiting. And I think that's a really important piece we could add. Yeah, absolutely. We at Destination Toronto, we partnered with Billy Bishop and we have a QR code that does just that and connects them to the event listings, um, among other things. I mean, we're, uh, we're promoting all of the things to do in the city, but um, but that is, is front and centre through that partnership. Ongoing conversations with the GTAA about, about how to do that there, um, but certainly it's, it's top of mind and it continues to be a conversation with Metrolinx um, being able to promote through, through the go in those channels too but back to the export piece I mean to me that that we've connected in the past with Toronto Global to talk about about the work here and particularly in the recording industry and being able to to attract folks to come here to utilize the services so that conversation happened in the last TMAC session I don't know what the outcome of that was but um, but that's a really great connective tissue to to maintain Thanks for the question, Kim. Uh, Marguerite, did you want to jump in? Just a very brief comment. Um, I would just say the city's festival and events calendar is a huge resource. Um, yep. Sorry. For, and so I, <laughs> I didn't take it personally, Sarah. We just might have competing calendars. Just, I just, <laughs> it wasn't purposeful. No, I just, because I really do think, like, if you're going to find artists that certain listings are, are, are looking for, for stuff that, you know, people are already aware of. They're celebrating what's not the discoverable, but the discovered. I think the festival and events calendar is an antidote to that. And yeah. so I just wanted to make sure it was on the radar. Excellent. On the list. My apologies. Any other questions or comments? Can I jump in here? Hi, Melissa. Sorry. Yeah. Online, um, over to you. Hi. Um, Sarah, thanks for presenting that. Nice job. We appreciate it. I had a question for the artists in the room as to, you know, based on that and based on where you've seen success and, and support, do you have any feedback or direction as to where you would like to see our committee dig more into? Sarah said off the top, we struggled a little bit as to who we're serving between fans, artists, and venues. Obviously, best case scenario, we're, we're serving everybody. But I'm just curious, again, to the artists in the room, if you have any feedback as to what you would like to see more of. <laughs> oh, no, I'm the artist in the room. <laughs> um, I would need to put some thought to that, but in terms of... <laughs> What was being said just now about um, export? Uh, yeah, I think cohesiveness was mentioned um, on a sort of like international level, um, painting the picture of kind of like what what are we as a as a city? Like, what are we sort of like representing and um, how do we sort of unified connect outside of, sorry, my mic is uh, glitching out over here. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question or Melissa, or if you had any sort of like um, specifics within that. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I'm more looking for, if anyone has any thoughts, you know, certainly give it, a, give it some thought, but if there's anything specific, like we are, you know, one of our tent poles is we're here to serve you. So if there's anything when firsthand, um, 
experience that would be helpful for us. Like certainly just shoot us an email or go through okay, Mike cool. or what have you. But And yeah, in, in further yeah. thought, I do think the listings piece is, is a big one. Um, I think just my personal experience not knowing exactly where to list things or exactly where to find things. Um, so having, I, I know there are tons of efforts to consolidate that information, but just spreading information about where to go to get that and making it easy to access, I think would be great. A comment as well, um, venue-wise, we're struggling with the same thing, how to reach that audience and where to. So maybe collectively putting our heads together so we're all, all getting equally represented and, and reaching our target audiences. Um, Air Canada, they had a, you know, a, the, the thing on the back, your little screen on the back of your seat, um, there's a little magazine or something that was on there. And they did a piece on the garrison. And we literally had people coming from all over the world and going, oh, well, I saw it on the back of the seat on the airplane, and we thought we'd start here. So it does work, and it's just finding those niches and people and, and places and tying them all together. It is a struggle right now because there's so much noise from so many different areas. But um, the destination, um, it, uh, I think, is a, a good focus for us to start. But yeah, how, how, to, just, how to get that information out and find our audience is uh, uh, something that we can uh, all collaborate and share on. Thanks, Sean. That was going to be my next question. And I would just, again, say for the venue group, if there's something for the smaller venues that you've seen happening for some of the bigger venues, I appreciate not everyone gets the same exposure as Scotiabank Arena. Uh, certainly let us know. And I think that's, you know, we can use that as we try to form our objectives. If I can chime in, it's uh, John Carew, Councillor. Uh, one of the things we're doing at the, the Tabia, and uh, we just received a little bit of funding. It's it's the uh, the initial uh, funding is that uh, we're we're uh, developing a program called uh, Activate Billy Bishop. We're working with Newport, Activate Billy Bishop, uh, connecting community. Uh, for most of you, you may know this. Billy Bishop is actually the largest airport in, uh, the ninth largest airport in Canada. Uh, fifth largest international airport based on the destinations to the U.S. And some three million people go through the uh, turnstiles, if you can call it that, uh, through that airport. Um, the Newport uh, deal that we've got cooking up right now is to put in an activation space, um, take up some of the uh, Newport portion at the arrivals level, before you go down that 90-foot escalator uh, that takes you into that tunnel, uh, right near the top of that, where we're going to be activating that space both in a, a QR code and, you know, maybe we can have two QR codes because it sounds like we've got a couple of competing directional uh, and, and informative uh, opportunities out there. But at the end of the day is to reach out to these folks uh, and let them know what's going on in the communities uh, across Toronto uh, in some of the venues. The idea is out there. Uh, honestly, uh, just started a conversation with Drake's people to have Drake cut a, uh, a short uh, clip. You know, basically, hey, it's Drake. Welcome to Toronto. Uh, this is where I live. This is where I play. And then the video shoots off into all the, you know, opportunities and venues that are out there, et cetera. And what's happening, and we're looking at it as being a, a, a weekly segment, really, putting that out there to let people know. Because many of the people that travel through Billy are one, two, three, maybe a week's uh, period of, of visitors. So they're always looking for stuff to do. So get them into our neighborhoods, et cetera. So it's it's an initiative where uh, we're in the design stage right now, actually, uh, just that money is gonna be used towards that and looking forward to that activation that's gonna benefit not only the BIAs across the city, the 84, but other opportunities. And again, you know, there's nothing keeping us from, and I'll be aging myself here, a week before Caravana, that uh, we have a couple of steel drums and uh, a costume 
individual there through the peak periods. And having that relationship with uh, Billy Bishop Newport, we know when the major flights are coming in. We know what the volumes are. So we'll book a three three hour window to promote those events or festivals that are happening at that time. So a lot of a lot of opportunity that comes around that it is our gateway. And I think we've been remiss in not taking advantage thus far. So hopefully this opportunity with all the good work that the destination and all the other and ECDEV is doing that we can uh, strengthen the activation with some relevant information. Just wanted to share that. Thanks very much, John. That sounds cool. Any other questions, comments? Yes. I think I would just um, love to ask the room for, you know, there, there's promotion via tourism, which has easier pathways, I think. But back to the listings question, you know, part of the challenge is getting Toronto audiences back to Toronto venues. So is it, is it the, the view that this task force takes on that as well, or is it strictly the visitor audience? Because it's, I mean, I, I would suggest maybe splitting it. it. That's a lot to take on, because trying to get audiences back into venues in the city, that's a Herculean task right now that every single artist and venue is struggling with, I think, but I don't know. Or is that the collective role of this entire group, <laughs> maybe. Um, others, others will probably want to jump in on that, but I would, I would say that um, breaking that Herculean task um, into just cleaning out the stables over here uh, to start with might be might be good. Um, prog programs like the like the music passport program it's a it's just chipping away at something qr codes is just chipping away at something so um to me it kind of feels more doable to get toronto audiences into toronto venues right now because they're here um we don't have you don't have this committee doesn't have the budget to be advertising in the new york times you know uh but but can we do things through the bia office through tabia through other networks that we have access to probably yeah they might be small things but they they might show some proof of concept and some traction that's my feeling i don't know what others might want to add to that charlotte yeah, I, I think when scenes get buzzy is when they're local and exciting, and then they get buzzy outside of town. So I think like starting at a local level, um, yeah, and just b like back on the listings things with regards to that, I, I have been going to individual venues and promoters' websites to like find out what's going on. So yeah, I do feel like the more the more accessible that information is. Not to say that it's not, not accessible, but the more um, the more it's all in one place, the the easier it is to kind of like get the word out about those things. Um. Johnny? Yeah, just like to um, <clears throat> follow, follow up on what's been said, it's getting Toronto audiences into Toronto venues to see Toronto artists. I think that's really what what we what we, what we want, and uh, yeah, we've we've talked a lot about the, the the challenges of competing listings as a presenter. We put our listings in every single place, but it's still it's, that's a lot of work mm -hmm. and a lot of duplication and, money. and and time and money. And um, there's definitely there there must be a way to consolidate. Mm -hmm. um, so I do I think as a second Sarah's suggestion that I think maybe a specific task team dedicated to that. This very, very defined task would, would be a good idea. We'll go Melissa and then Sean. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how it, but there's also seems to be a question in the audience, but I'm not sure how it works to filter through that. Um, I, I didn't, was that a rhetorical question for contemplation or? Sorry, did I mishear what you said there? I apologize. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, go ahead, Melissa. Okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think just sort of to your point and to give you insight when we're having this conversation, we're thinking about how, uh, you know, venue listings are crucial to responding to the way that people don't make one stop 
over the course of a night, right? They might go to something big at a larger venue that has more visibility and then you need a second destination afterwards and that's oftentimes where you get a lot of really great overflow and really feel the sort of like interconnectedness between different sizes and different scales of the um you know our sort of music community so yeah it 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 feels like a big task but also feels like one um that I'm curious to think about ways we can really chip away at it together Okay, we'll go Sean, and then we'll go Charlotte, and then Sarah. So Sarah, the, the short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> it seems to be a priority for everyone. Um, so, uh, and again, we're not just gonna throw it on your desk. I think if we all work together, um, we're, we're all feeding out into these different systems. If we, if we all share a common place, if we all share, if we, you know, share that information that all the things that we're feeding into it, it that that's going to focus it and the audience is going to know to go there. And I think that's the, that's the task where we need to go. All right, it's going to be there. And we all feed into that and, and share that information with the audiences. That that seems like a fairly straightforward, um, you know, starting point anyway. So I think it's amongst all the task force to you know, that we all tackle it together on your desk. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Charlotte, and then yeah, Sarah. I just wanted to give an example just based on what Melissa just said of um, that spillover from a big kind of international event to a local scene. Um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I think it was in the summer when uh, Anderson Pack was in town and he came, he was like a massive artist. He showed up at DRAM and played with a bunch of local musicians. And the next day, it was like exploding everywhere. And it, <laughs> I think it's an example of like um, <laughs> putting a local spot on the map, bringing it like tons of international attention. And then it's like if anyone who reads that article or reads, sees that post is going to check out what's happening at DRAM when they're in town or whatever. Okay, I'm gonna jump online because uh, there's a couple questions there. I think Julian and then Jeremy, and then we'll come back in the room. Um, Julian, over to you, then we'll do Jeremy. Oh, it was just a long question from a long time ago about it just being easier to find things in the city when we had, you know, papers in every venue, like now and I'm magazine. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, everybody's on their phone, but is there some sort of way that we can pair up with somebody to make something like that a, a, available that's physical in each one of these venues that, that there used to be? And I, it's one thing to have it at the airport and stuff like that, but it's one thing when you're just walking around town. There is head nodding in the room. Uh, Mike's jumping in here. Yeah, I think, uh, Julian, I think that's what Next Magazine has been striving to do for the last couple of years, is actually have a physical copy in as many venues as uh, as makes sense. And I think it really just comes down to dollars and cents and, and distribution mm -hmm. and advertising and how to make that nut work for, for Next or any other publication. Um, I, I don't know right. the answer So my to that. question is... Yeah. My question is, would the city of Toronto be willing to team up with somebody like Next or, uh, you know, initiative that really does help that in, in each one of the venues and, and record stores or just anywhere, really? I mean, you could just start with it in the summer for pat patio season and see what happens. But that's just my question. Uh, I know it's not a really good one, but it's something that's missing. Julian, Marguerite Piggott speaking. Um it is something that's missing, and I, I know it's something people want. Um, in terms of like one of the considerations related to that, of course, is sustainability and net zero strategies and things like that. So that's something that we, you know, that I would put on the table as an additional consideration as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then in terms of you know what the city would would consider partnering with, I, I think that totally depends on what ends up you know, being developed and on the table and what the role of the city would be. And I would, again, say, you know, the festival and events calendar, which is something we have that's online, gets a huge amount of hits. Alok, how many hits? Uh, about half a million a year. 
about half a million a year. Um, and so, and, and it has a lot of room to grow. So I, I would say that there are a bunch of considerations, but I do recognize um, what you're saying about there being a gap. I miss paper too, but um, you know, the sustainability issue is a real one to consider as well. Right. Okay. I have a comment related. What about the West End Phoenix? That seems like that might be an obvious partner on this. They're doing slow press print. Uh, yep, yeah, we know we know Dave well. Um, I think any of those things are are interesting to explore. Uh, I think what we can say is we can we can explore them. We can we can look at how we might how if and how a partnership or support might be possible. We can also probably talk to not probably we can talk to Alok and his team about um, maybe a a music specific element of festivals that I'm just making this up sorry um, <laughs> yeah so category specificity around being able to sort of blow that out and really have it do a deep dive into the sector and the audiences and the artists and the venues and the events that we all we all care about you know I don't know enough about how the festivals and events calendar works but maybe there's a way of making that um, more resonant to, to the community Sean, did you want to jump in responding to Julian? Yes. Okay. Sean, and then we'll get to Jeremy. Great. Uh, Julian, yeah, uh, it's been an ongoing conversation, the kind of lack of now or I magazine uh, pre-internet showing our age. Um, I see. I do see some uh, publications at my venues. They don't get a lot of engagement anymore, unfortunately, and I hate to throw the negative in, um, but you know, if there's a stack of 20 dropped off, there's two or three or four that go. So um, people, that's why we're trying to refocus um, to, hey, you know, it's it's this device. That's how people get their information now. Um, not that we can't do a simple something, but um, the engagement seems to be lower. Um, and uh, that's, you know, people that grew up with phones where we grew up with that newspaper. I think that's the very simple short answer of that's the difference. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to Jeremy online and then I think Sarah in the room. Is that right? Okay. Oh. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, just give a quick note about uh, the, so the Destination Toronto website uh, is a great sort of hub. It looks like I'm just looking at it now uh, again, but it doesn't, it, it could use some more like direct uh, venue listing. It's hard to sort of drill down into some of the nightlife stuff. Uh, it does talk about festival and events and there's, you know, which pub you go to. Um, but I think, I think there's room for improvement um there as far as like a venue listing section um and that's maybe something that that committee could look into great comment seeing some uh some nodding in here uh umer i uh, know just on that like there is now playing toronto which already exists so i guess we all just have to do our part and submit to them it's a pretty amazing platform. I have it on my phone right now. It is an online event listing by Destination Toronto, uh, now playing toronto.com. It looks pretty sleek and nice. Maybe we just need a orientation for venues that are not submitting and start from there. Good point. Um, I'm coming back in the room here. Sarah, then Melissa, okay. I'm just going to, just for those that aren't familiar with Now Playing Toronto, Now Playing Toronto was built as a, 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 intended to be a database, really, a main source for event producers to come post their events. There are some automated feeds that come into the site. It pulls in Ticketmaster Collective Concerts um, already. Uh, and then the intention is to push those feeds out to all of the places where people go to find out what's happening in the city. The intention was to make it easier for event producers so you're not having to post it in many places. We're not necessarily here to change consumer behaviors and drive where they go to find out information because that's hard to do because everyone has different ways of consuming stuff, be it paper, be it TikTok, be it word of mouth. So 
our, our aim is to try to get the most information to the most places as possible um, and honoring how people like to learn what to do. What's missing currently, and I think, Mike, you've brought this up numerous times, is that expert voice. You can put any number of listings in front of an audience, but it may need, mean nothing to folks. So what is missing is that influence, that piece where, where the experts are, are helping inform um, and shift perceptions about what to do. That, to me, the opportunity there doesn't necessarily lie in articles or listings, it lies in social, because that's where most new audiences are going to find out what's happening. So, um, you know, we remember the day of now, that day is gone. Now Toronto is back under new ownership. They are one of the platforms that take the events feed from Now Playing Toronto. Um, and uh, and so, you know, we're, we're continuing to try to educate ven uh, venues and producers on the merits of it, but uh, it's a slow build, um, and we're trying to get there. So, yeah, that's that's my pitch. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Melissa? Um, yeah, I just uh, have a question around um, maybe for some folks in the room what um, your experience has been uh, kind of managing the listing side as it applies to some, like, new... Um, like applications that I feel have really been gaining traffic in the city like Dice, which I think is like a nice alternative for folks who are programming music on the grassroots side. And um, the feedback that I've heard from a lot of members of the community is a real appreciation for the listings kind of categorization and having something that actually feels like it's a little bit more robust and dynamic. That being said, it being another primarily um, kind of ticket generating platform so it's not cohesive but it is one option and then maybe when we consider that there are a lot of different ways that people sort of find out about music it's a matter of thinking about where that's consolidated so maybe that can be something we consider um, as part of what a TMAC landing page might look like is really having a site where you know, we kind of provide and platform a lot of those different options available. Johnny? Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, I was thinking about DICE as well. Um, Wavelength has moved over to using DICE for ticketing. I think Transmit and Garrison has as well. And there does seem to be DICE, for those who don't know, is I believe a UK uh, company that started and is moving over to North America and um, in addition to being a ticketing platform they do have a marketing function and their app is very user friendly it's connected to Spotify so it's connected to so it recommends things to you based on your on your uh, musical taste or your, your algorithmic listening um, so it, it is a very a very uh, sophisticated tool but very very app based um, and yes, uh, speaking as a former iWeekly listings <laughs> editor, and um, and uh, I remember the day, the days of print and with fondness. But I do believe, as nice as it is, I do think that those are, that is the past. And um, and thinking about Marguerite's point about sustainability, and and bring bring it back. And by the way, I want do want to shout out to now, now playing Toronto. I think it's a, fa a fantastic portal. Mm. But bringing it back to Melissa's point about the tech sector, maybe there is the opportunity to create some kind of an app that you. AI to pull in from all the different listing sources to actually to um, and then kind of uh, cancel out duplication and then I don't know if it can incorporate uh, I mean Spotify is very based on curators you know maybe that app incorporates um, the expert voices somehow in terms of recommendations beyond an al purely um, inhuman algorithmic <laughs> uh, basis no offense to our AI friends um, that's my humble and naive suggestion. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. All right, that's good. Any other? That was a. That one was a talker. That was good. <laughs> uh, any other? Uh, any other comments? We'll close it off on promotion and tourism. All right, I'm gonna. I'm looking online. We're all good. Okay. Um, well, that. 
that was nice to spend our time doing that. I think like everybody is clearly on the task teams uh, working very hard and focused and there's a lot of good stuff coming out of that. And I think as we have subsequent meetings throughout the balance of the year here, uh, we can come back with some key takeaways. So my gratitude and thanks to all of you for doing that work because as, as somebody made the point, uh, you guys are all busy and uh, I know it's work and time. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I guess uh, with no other speakers on this, uh, can I have a motion to receive the item? Motion to receive the item. Okay, uh, Sean, uh, motion to receive, all in favor? Okay, that carries, very good. So we've got a couple staff presentations. Um, the first one is the implementation review of the noise bylaw. I will just say that there's like uh, four staff presentations plus a meeting schedule. So we have a few items. I personally have a hard stop at 12. I know you'll be done by then, uh, but for everyone in the room and our, uh, our wonderful vice chair, uh, Sean will step in to carry you through if we're not done, but we'll keep these presentations short and sweet. Okay, very good, over to you. Oh, Mitch. All right, Mitch Tebow. Yes. Uh, is here from MLS, everybody. Mitch is with us and he'll give us an update on the implementation of noise bylaw review. Thanks, Chair. And thanks for getting my last name right. Not a lot of people do. Um, my name is Mitch Tebow. I'm a policy and planning advisor uh, with Municipal Licensing and Standards. Um, I was here at the first meeting in November to talk about the noise bylaw review um, and I'm here to provide a very brief update on some of the changes that were approved by City Council uh, last week on February 7th. Um, I'll make a note, I'm just going to go over some of the changes at a high level, um, but we'll just note that we will be back with this committee to engage further on these changes and um, any kind of additional work that will come from them. Um, so I'll just... Um, get right into it. Um, so yeah, this just want to provide a brief overview of these changes, some of the timing of the implementation, and some of the additional pieces that we'll be considering um, later on in the year. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so just on amplified sound, um, so these are a few of the changes that were approved by council last week, and these changes will take effect on June 1st of this year. Um, so particularly on amplified sound, um, council did approve a reduction in the indoor overnight amplified sound decibel limits. These are measured, uh, again, from a point of reception, um, not from the source. Um, so this was um, kind of intended to strike a balance between what we heard, uh, I think, from this community and, and others, um, other residents particularly. Um, you know, we received advice and, and feedback that we should lower these limits further and also consideration to measure from the source, which um, we really um, held the line that measuring from the point of reception is the best way to measure excessive noise impacts. Um, so this is the um, kind of balance that we struck and it was approved by council. The second thing on this section was just that instrument sound is now incorporated into this section, just to provide some clarity in the bylaw about where um, those particular elements um, are uh, incorporated. The next thing, I know this is a lot of text and all this uh, deck is available um, online in your email as well, um, but just a few changes to the exemption permit process, which I know um, a lot of organizers um, engage with us on, um, and getting noise exemption permits for anything that might exceed uh, the provisions in the noise bylaw. So um, some pretty significant changes here that will come into effect uh, September 1st. Um, I think the first two um, are the biggest ones that I'll just emphasize here. Um, we're working on um, implementing an activity-based exemption permit process. Um, essentially right now our existing process, we're treating every permit the same, um, whether it's you know a small concert that's happening on a weekend in July or a significant construction project that wants to work extra hours um, you know, for a year. Um, so we really want to work at kind of stratifying the noise exemption permit process um, to focus on the um, permits of the most significant impact. And the second element was we kind of modernized and changed the decibel condition for these exemption permits, um, which right now if you are um, given an exemption permit, um, you have to meet the 85 decibel A-weighted limit that's measured 20 meters from the source. I think we heard uh, quite 
strongly from this committee, particularly last year, that this um, condition is quite unreasonable to comply with. Um, so the change that was made is that it's 85 dBA or 105 dBC measured from the lot line um, of the property where that event or activity is happening um, specifically for amplified sound. Um, find this is a bit more of a, a reasonable um, condition um, for amplified permits to comply with. Um, a few additional things. Um, we want to make sure that we're allowing online notice of an exemption permit to be permitted. Um, if it's if if uh, operators are not able to post at a physical location, um, and a council also approved um, exempting not-for-profit organizations from um, a permit fee. Um, which is a change that was approved last week. In addition, we wanted just to set out a, a clear timeline for when MLS wants to see some of those permits come in, around 28 days before um, the event or activity, just to ensure that we're able to process these applications and permits um, as quickly as possible. And I'll also note um, that as part of these changes, uh, MLS will also be hiring a coordinator to focus on the administration of these exemption permits, to engage with um, applicants as well as with counselor's offices. Um, we found that um, our staff were having a hard time keeping up with the volume of permits uh, and making sure that they're administered efficiently. Um, so I think this additional staff member will help um, with those issues. And just a few things here, I know there's a lot of words, I'll just summarize quickly. This is some additional direction that we did get from Council that we'll be um, focusing on uh, for the remainder of this year. Um, again, around consultation and engagement, some direction to continue to consult with this committee to conduct some public education initiatives, as well as um, host some public sessions during the implementation of these bylaw changes. In addition to that, we've been directed to report back to committee on a few additional um, bylaw, um, potential bylaw uh, amendments um, or provisions. Um, the first is to focus on potentially setting out some specific decibel ranges for the amplified sound section um, when sound levels exceed the ambient. Um, this is something done in New York, something we did not recommend implementing as part of the report last week, um, but something that we will be considering um, in additional detail, as well as looking at exploring and defining um, a potential exemption for grassroots cultural organizations for those noise, uh, noise exemption permit fees. And the last slide, um, just kind of reiterate some of our timelines moving forward. The two implementation dates of June and September, um, we're looking, I think, around the summer and early fall to do some of those public education initiatives. And also, for those of you that um, do um, apply for noise exemption permits, we are aiming to move to an online permit application system um, instead of a manual email-based system. Um, that work is ongoing, and we're hoping to implement that um, at the beginning of next year. Um, so I'm, I'll stop there. I hope that was uh, brief and happy to take any questions. And just to note again, um, I'm in frequent contact with Mike and EDC, happy to chat about any of these elements and we'll also be back at this committee and we can take further questions and talk about some of the additional details of these uh, changes that were approved last week. Thank you, Mitch. Expeditious in your delivery, well done. Uh, and I'll just say I saw Umer snapping some photos here we're going to send this deck and all the subsequent decks out to the committee afterwards so you're going to have all that because there's a lot of information and the ones that come any questions for mitch we have time for questions don't feel like you can't ask questions of course i'm um, just pulling up the screen online to see uh if we can i can't see online yet just for people who are online any questions in the room Yes, Sarah. Just, I mean, a, a statement, really. Um, I know that squeaky wheels get lots of attention uh, when complaints come in. I don't know how many calls come in to the city saying, I love that this festival is here. It makes my life better. Thank you. Um, as a listing site, we get complaints all the time for events that are happening, thinking that we should do something about it, uh, which is fun to respond to. But um, I wonder if there's an initiative we can have within one of the subcommittees to encourage festivals, events, venues, to encourage patrons to share the positive of their experience so that there's perhaps a better balance of support from community. Um. Others may may want to comment on that, uh, Sarah. I think you call it the the good the good feedback line or something like that. Um, we we have counselors 
here as part of TMAC. And I'm actually kind of interested to hear what um, the councillors may have to say on your question um, in terms of what kinds of responses, feedback you guys get coming into the offices, you know, around events, around sound, around vibrancy, around engagement. And do you see an opportunity to help get some balance in, in that if there is indeed any imbalance? I can say very quickly, and we're fortunate to have Deputy Mayor Usma Malik here as well, who probably has to deal with this more than anybody else. But I, I've got Castro's on Queen Street and a uh, great little spot. Um, and over the years, there has been a particular resident that, you know, gets exercised about this. And um, I think some of the changes to measurement from um, from the property line uh, as opposed to the source directly, those things are helpful. Um, there was a lot of discussion at council about this, the decibel decrease. Uh, I could tell you trying to change the noise bylaw on the floor of council is not the best way to do it. And that's why we had motions to come back here to work with Mitch and his team for additional feedback. Um, I err on more of the like again my circumstances in my riding are are different than others but I'm, I'm generally on the like i like the live music i like venues all that sort of stuff um but you know we we definitely all of us whether it's like leaf blowers or live music or whatever like you get feedback on noise and i think that's why this is such a long and sort of contentious process of trying to balance everybody's needs but particularly from the live music sector uh you understand that there are requirements and if these venues are going to exist and be able to exist and focused on providing live music and great experiences for people you know they can't be seized and caught up with fighting bylaw all the time so there's more work to do it that's why mitch is coming back and that's why this is actually such a critical input and there's been more direction to engage with tmac directly uh, because deputy mayor's in the room here i'll turn it over to usma Thank you very much, and thanks for the question. Um, and I also want to give um, uh, so much appreciation for the team uh, that has been uh, managing the review of the noise bylaws. And I do think what is important is that there has been a really thoughtful approach to the different categories of the types of sound, which I think is really critical to you know our considerations um, on this committee. And my office has been engaged in every step of the way when it comes to uh, public consultation, um, because uh, probably won't surprise you, uh, Spadina Fort York um, high, has the highest volume of noise uh, complaints in the city. And um, the most important thing for me and in the conversations I've been having with residents and uh, folks who are enjoying and, and participating and are part of the uh, the economy of our live music venues and the events uh, that we put on, especially in our downtown, is that, you know, we want to be able to hold all of that together, right? That, um, and I'm as someone who lives right in the downtown, we're here and we we are not foolish about what the expectations can be about being in the city and that's why we're here very often, right? Um, and that, you know, the unreasonableness, the persistence, and I think one of the added dimensions of this that is really important is also not just sound but vibrations, right? That as we, you know, live closer to each other, as we uh, continue to encourage, you know, many different mixed uses in uh, in every part of our city, that that has to be part at the heart of our our work and our considerations. Um, so, you know, for me, I guess it's important that our rules are changing in order to meet and match the current context. I think that has been a huge source of, of concern. So I'm excited about what that will mean for the overall complaints and the capability to, to address them appropriately. Um, and so I do think on, on the whole, um, being able to kind of understand what might go up in terms of the concerns and how quickly they might be addressed, we have to be looking at this through some agreed upon metrics. Um, and also, you know, that idea that, um, you know, who's doing it well or to be able to hear um, about experiences that have gone well, I do think that's probably an invitation that we should be giving to residents and business owners and, and uh, uh, event organizers, right, to be able to say what is working about your, our relationship um, to, you know, 
noise, the rules in the city, and that are you know kind of addressing the gaps that we've seen in the last little while. Um, and you know, very often uh, the only time we do here is when things go aren't going right. Uh, so when you don't hear anything at all, <laughs> it's uh, it's just speculation, but also. In, a, in some ways, no news is good news, right? And so uh, I think that while that might be a relief when we get to, to work on uh, some other issues in the office as well, I do think that that doesn't necessarily help us in terms of what are the lessons that we're learning and how can we continue to improve and move in the direction of what is working. So I do invite that as a consideration for the, um, for the MLS team and happy to uh, you know, have a conversation about what that looks like in terms of our engagements and especially because so many folks are reaching out to us on this particular issue having, um, I guess, uh, unique uh, sight lines into this. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Umer. All right. Thank you, first of all. Thank you to your team, Mitch. This is amazing, and what a relief. I know there is ways to go, but the changes that you've been able to uh, achieve uh, will have a real deep impact. I was taking a photo so I can send it to my team on Slack, and there is like 20 messages of clapping and celebration, so... <laughs> Good to hear. Uh, it's remarkable that you know this has been achieved. Uh, a few comments. I think um, we are one of those festivals in the Spadina Fort Chalk region that has. It's just a high density area, and we get a lot of complaints. Uh, our first hand experience has also been with those. In, what do you call them? Enforcement bylaw enforcement officers. Um, and it's not been a pleasant experience, so if there could be a consideration on training these people, as in they're not coming into bust a crime, they're coming into community festivals and celebrations, so, you know, there's a difference between an um, anti-terrorist squad, uh, <laughs> you know, crack commando team and a law um, enforcement officer. Um, so just something to consider, really. Um, on the point made by, I think it was Sarah, for positive feedback, all of our festivals collect a lot of positive feedback from our patrons. We do surveys, we get social media comments, so I appreciate that uh, all of you get complaints, and when you're sitting at a policy level, you're looking at the amount of complaints, we have the data to offset those complaints as well. So if the councillor offices are sort of figuring out what balances the complaints versus the praises, we can always provide the data. We just need to be asked. Um, and that's really a thank you. Thank you. Maybe just make Thanks, one man. comment. I think maybe it might be fruitful for us to come back um, to this committee and maybe talk about some of the operational issues that you might have been experiencing with um, our staff, um, particularly when exemption permits are issued. Um, that's something that I, I mean, have a sight line into just by engaging with our staff, operational staff, but of course I'm not a bylaw enforcement officer, so I think as part of these changes are implemented, getting a sense of what we could do better and what we can actually change operationally would be really helpful. Um, so I'd be happy to commit to doing that. And also I think um, some of your comments, Sarah, about um, getting more feedback about the positive elements of when even a permit is issued. I think when we go through these changes and change the permit template, there are maybe some pathways we could include for like, hey, call 311 if you have a noise complaint, but also here's another avenue if you are at this event um, and you're having a good time and you're having a good experience and the, the noise levels aren't excessive, um, that's something that we can take back and, and discuss further as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, did I see Kristen online with the hand? Okay, over to you. Yeah, I, although I think actually Umer said quite literally exactly what I was going to say. A lot of us who host festivals and events, um, besides the kind of informal feedback of social media um, and things like that, a lot of us do conduct surveys. Um, and so if there was a way to kind of officially submit those surveys to the counselor's office within the ward where those events take place, just to mark all of that positive experience to balance some of the noise complaints. We're just saying in the room, we should do that. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, so Marguerite, Mike, Jacqueline and I are just uh, sort of agreeing that would be very helpful, I think. So thank you for that. Uh, any other questions, comments? 
I'll just comment quickly yeah, that I've attended a, a lot of the noise bylaw uh, meetings and um, uh, the, the previous session before. There's a lot of people there complaining and that's the nature of it. So yes, uh, supporting that idea of, hey, let's get the engagement where where there's a, they, MLS gets to see a fair balance, not just a negative um, view. Yeah, yeah, would be uh, fantastic. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, there is an organized, couple organized groups there, Toronto Noise Coalition, et cetera. So the more organizing we can do collectively, uh, I think that is a, a nice sort of counterbalance there. Uh, probably helps Mitch. Uh, okay, let's, uh, Amber, I see you're, uh, you're here too. Did you wanna jump in on this or are you all good? Yes? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I just want to, like, I also have to hop off at noon, but I'll jump back in if the, the, the group is still meeting. Um, I have an hour commitment, but um, just wanted to flag that as part of the night economy expansion, something that we're doing in Etobicoke Lakeshore is really deepening the engagement to bring residents along this journey. Um, exactly for the reasons that were highlighted here today. We often hear more complaints than sort of compliments as it relates to things, particularly noise. Um, and when we look at sort of expanding opportunities for the music industry and nightlife, et cetera, outside of the downtown core, this is a change, right? This is something new for residents and there are a lot of incredible benefits. And so, um, you know, we did move a motion and amendment to that expansion to really deepen that engagement for our community members Again, to try to not only um, have space for them to, to share their input, but also to help them appreciate the value this will bring to our neighborhoods um, and, you know, engage them along the process so we can mitigate concerns as they arise. So, um, yeah, really excited about that ongoing work and seeing how this animation in neighborhoods like mine will help build stronger neighborhoods. So just wanted to add that little piece. Thank you so much. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, anyone else? We good? Thanks, Mitch. Thanks to you and your team. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you back again soon. Oh, I guess I have to formally say, uh, okay. Uh, formalities, hearing no further speakers. Uh, do I have a motion to receive the item? Okay, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Jarvis, motion all in favor? Carried. All right. Next item, 2.3. Update, review of zoning, regulations for outdoor patios. Um, Mike Tanner was nice enough to help me with a little amendment here for a couple guitars and a couple amps and formalize that. But we're gonna get a presentation here from Jamie Atkinson at City Planning. And uh, as mentioned, I'm gonna have to roll, but we're going to leave the chair in Sean's capable hands. And thanks everybody. Uh, great, thank you everybody. Um, hello, I'm Jamie Atkinson from the zoning section of the City Planning Division. And today I'm pleased to provide an update to this committee on changes to zoning regulations for outdoor patios on private property, especially as it relates to new opportunities to support live music and other entertainment in the city. It's showing is on, yeah. Um, before I get into the main part of the presentation, I think it's important to clarify that outdoor patios on private property usually refer to patios in the rear yard of establishments or patios erected over parking spaces. Zoning only regulates patios on private property, not outdoor patios on public property like most sidewalk patios or patios placed in the curb lane, which are under the CAFE TO program. So with that being said, I'll move on to the zoning update for private po property outdoor patios. Last year, we conducted a comprehensive review of all outdoor patio zoning regulations and made a wide range of changes. But today, I will be focusing on the ones that we find are most relevant to supporting live music and other entertainment in the city. And the great thing about these changes are that they are in effect now and can be relied upon for our upcoming patio season. The first change is that the zoning bylaw now permits small entertainment areas in most commercial zones, park zones, and industrial zones on major streets. And prior to this, entertainment of any kind was not permitted on outdoor patios in any zone in the city. 
So this is a really big change. We hope we will, uh, will play a part of supporting live music in the city. These entertainment areas on outdoor patios can be a maximum of five square meters or 55 square feet or 10% of the outdoor patio area, whichever ends up being the greater value. I also want to note here that the entertainment needs to be on a ground floor patio and they're not permitted on rooftop patios. Another significant change to the zoning bylaw is the reduction of the required distance between the outdoor patio and a lot in the residential zone. And in more plain terms, this means the required distance between the edge of the outdoor patio and the property line of any property located in one of the city's lower density residential zones. That required distance has been reduced from 30 meters down to 10 meters, or 100 feet down to 33 feet in most commercial zones. This is a really important change for establishments on commercial main streets across the city, where we found during our study that it was extremely difficult to be able to set up an outdoor patio based on the old distance requirement. So in conclusion, outdoor patios can now have small entertainment areas in most commercial, parks, and industrial zones, and changes have been made so that they can be more easily established in commercial main street areas in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank this committee for the opportunity to provi provide this update, and I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, great presentation. Any questions? And what's the rationale for uh, prohibiting um, performances on uh, rooftop patios? Um, that was uh, uh, based uh, partially uh, upon um, just uh, complaints we received uh, you know, during the review process. And also, most of our commercial uses are oriented towards the ground floor. Um, so this is just kind of matching uh, that condition um, uh, to where we would uh, typically expect the commercial uses, especially like uh, along the commercial main streets, like I was talking about, where you'll usually have the commercial use on the ground floor and then residential above that. So it would also affect the residential uh, uses as well. So it's a strictly complaint based. It's not based around any sort of actual dis uh, dis difference in sound transmission from, uh, from uh, uh, say, a sound system being raised up higher? It's, it's partially based on, on that and concerns that we heard during the consultation um, about uh, noise uh, and entertainment on patios in general. So it's partially on that, and it's partially matching what we would typically see in the uh, commercial zones where uh, commercial uh, and more active uses would be located. John, if I could just add, um, Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I believe that um, in a way this, uh, this limitation to ground floor actually parallels um, a change in the zoning bylaw recently, um, which allows um, nightclubs in, in places in the city where they weren't allowed before, but but not on not a you know up in a building, mm. ground floor mezzanine, but mm. not further up in a building, and and that is because uh, historically. Uh, nightclubs that were operating, you know, five stories up, ten stories up, were creating a lot of problems for people living in ad adjacent buildings. And so, uh, city planning through the zoning bylaw review process uh, has expanded the areas in the city where nightclubs can go, but but they have to stay on the ground floor or on a mezzanine floor. Is that correct? Uh, yes, thank you, Mike. And I would say it, it complements the changes you're about to hear. And I also just wanted to add that what we, uh, what I've presented here are as of right conditions. So uh, the, these changes to the zoning bylaw allow you to um, establish uh, entertainment areas without, you know, sort of a, a, a more um, detailed approval process. But uh, where somebody would want to set up a rooftop um, outdoor patio that has entertainment, um, they can proceed with a, a committee of adjustment application and discuss the mitigation efforts for um, that rooftop patio that has entertainment. Uh, to the committee for their uh, consideration. Thanks for explaining that, Jamie. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Online? Um, 
Just a quick thought. Uh, this is the kind of thing where I sometimes think that when the city makes a positive change, it should be screamed from the rooftops, no pun intended. Um, uh, but this, this was actually affected by city planning um, in the fall, just before the holidays. And it, 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 with all the, uh, you know, work around night economy work and noise bylaw consultations, I felt it sort of got lost in the shuffle a little bit. And what it effectively does uh, in the view of the music office is it opens up a lot of real estate across the city. Uh, what we think of as private patios are those patios that just about all of us go to when we go through a bar or restaurant into the back. There's the patio. Now you can have entertainment back there. You can have musicians playing back there. Before you couldn't even have Marcel Marceau back there doing something that's entertainment but was silent. So this is a big change in the same way that Cafe TO opened up a lot of bookable real estate, performable real estate along curb lanes. This opens up that same kind of opportunity and we hope, and we will certainly, Jacqueline and I, be assisting the sector, people who promote, people who book, people who play, uh, venues themselves, to take use, uh, to take advantage of this change. So thank you, Jamie, for, for explaining it. Sarah? Just a question. Um, I'm excited at the notion of a resurgence of the mime industry as a result of this. Thank you, Mike, for advocating for that. Um, so to allow for this to really flourish, are there going to be systems in place or are, are there business supports to those venues to be able to um, bring in the infrastructure to support the musicians coming or is the expectation that the musicians will just come with their gear and that's that? Um, I would say more the latter than the former. I think it's a lot like booking the room inside your venue. Uh, now you're just booking it outside. However, Jacqueline, um, uh, Jacqueline has been very helpful to individual uh, venues and to BIAs in assisting with um, booking, programming, production, questions, etc., around Cafe TO. And the music office would certainly be uh, willing to assist, probably more with advising, connecting. Here's where you can get a, you know, a small PA that would be suitable for this kind of thing. Here's some organizations that you can partner with to help book your patio, that kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the uh, restaurants that were part of uh, Cafe Tio uh, when we first launched the Amplified Live Music uh, pilot. Um, some had never booked music before, so it was a great new way of creating more paid opportunities for local artists. Um, and yeah, we certainly help people. So this is how you would, you know, approach an artist and standard pay. But we did a survey after, and um, in terms of like your question about like would there be support from the city like in paying musicians, I would say that of all of the restaurants that participated, um, it was like 90% or something uh, reported back and uh, a boost in in their sales and their business and their customers so that was the whole intention of that is that if you if you book it they will come and so it will um, boost your business uh, through booking local artists so yeah I think those costs that's the that's the hope the costs offset by the uptick in business is uh, the Knight Economy Town Hall, um, Alok Shamar and Lauren McCollum from Economic Development and Culture will give a presentation on the Knight Economy Town Hall. Hi, everyone. Mr. Uh, Chair, if I, oh. if I can, uh, I move receipt of the presentation. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm Alok Sharma, the manager of the Visitor Economy Office, and I, we're just going to talk a little bit about the Night Economy Town Hall that took place on January 17th at Beanfield Center. 
so there were several presentations uh, from five different divisions, including economic development and culture, city planning, municipal licensing and standards, as well as social development, finance and administration, and Toronto Public Health. And we also had opening remarks by the Knight Economy Champion, Councillor Paul Ainsley, as well as Deputy Mayor Malik. So thanks to both of them. Uh, we're happy to say that we had well over 100 people in attendance uh, in person, which was great for the first uh, Knight Economy Town Hall. And we had 200 plus people join us virtually. So the purpose of the Night Economy Town Hall was really to share the findings of the Toronto Night Economy uh, Review. And uh, th through that consultation process, we, uh, we had input from about 3,300 people. And there were a couple of things that we heard. And not, uh, I don't think a lot of this is going to be a surprise, but it's important for us to touch upon. Cost, uh, transportation, and access to nearby activities are the most frequent barriers for people to participate in, night, in nighttime activities. So getting to the downtown core where a lot of nighttime activities was, uh, was certainly a barrier, as well as the cost to, to get uh, uh, downtown. Uh, conflict related to sound and noise is one of the biggest concerns that was shared uh, at the consultations. And what was interesting about this, it wasn't just neighborhood associations, it was also uh, night operators as well as night economy patrons. And uh, operators themselves really emphasize the need uh, to have, uh, to be able to be flexible. So that need for flexibility, adaptability, and autonomy was really crucial for the night economy to thrive. All of this really led to the need of updating the zoning and licensing regulations to better reflect the needs of the industry. And I'm gonna pass it now to uh, Jamie, who's gonna speak a, a bit about the zoning regulatory changes, and then to Mitch, who will talk about the licensing changes. Jamie? Uh, great, thank you, Alok. Um, so now we'll discuss updated changes to the zoning bylaw for entertainment in the city. And just as a quick summary, zoning regulates where certain entertainment uses are permitted to locate in the city and how the space can be used. And then they are complemented with business licensing, licensing regulations, which will be discussed next. So, effective January 1st, 2025, entertainment will be able to occupy up to 25% of the area in restaurants or bars in most commercial, parks, and industrial zones. In addition to live music, these entertainment areas can include arcade games, a dance floor, a DJ area, karaoke, or physical games like mini golf or bowling. The maximum area used to be 6%, but we heard through our consultations that the former 6% amount was not adequate to realistically provide entertainment and can be difficult to measure out. The second major change to the zoning is the ability for nightclubs to be established in commercial zones outside the downtown area, in places like Etobicoke, North York, and Scarborough. Prior to this change, nightclubs were permitted in the downtown area only, which we heard during public consultations creates a barrier to people accessing a full range of entertainment options outside the downtown area. These nightclubs are subject to some additional zoning conditions, the most notable being that they must be in a non-residential or fully commercial building. And now we'll turn it over to Mitch to provide a licensing update. Sorry, I'm sticking over here. Um, whiplash, moving your heads around. Um, I'll speak just to some of the licensing elements that'll be um, in effect on January 1st, 2025. Um, I think as Sean noted at the beginning, I'm, Mike uh, kind of arranged for the task force on venue health to um, engage with uh, Jamie and I um, to discuss some of their comments about this process and we'll continue to engage with that task force about um, just some of the pain points, some of the questions that might come up um, throughout this year before we um, move towards towards implementation on January 1st. Um, I've noted here just a few examples of some of the updated um, business licensing categories that were approved by council last year. Um, so I'm sure as many of you know, our, our uh, licensing bylaw um, is quite antiquated, um, uses quite strange language. A lot of the licensing requirements um, um, can be um, you know, a bit superfluous or odd, so we really work to try and modernize this framework, set out some clear categorizations for businesses. Um, so you'll, you'll note the eating and drinking establishment, we really wanted to enable a more flexible hybrid definition here, make sure it's aligning more um, with the zoning bylaw. Um, and the middle piece I think is in, uh, the most important to clarify, which is the introduction of a new license category 
category um, called an entertainment place of assembly um, category. Um, this is intended to capture public halls, live music venues, other rental spaces for entertainment um, with a focus on patrons that are attending venues as an entertainment experience or as an audience member. Um, so this was um, per direction from council to have kind of a really specific pathway um, for live music venues to fit into you know, an updated um, licensing framework. And on the right, we also made some changes to kind of simplify, modernize, and strengthen our definition requirements for um, a nightclub, um, and also strengthening some of our um, security requirements um, as part of the licensing bylaw. Uh, I'll move to the next slide. This just lays out um, what the transition period will look like. Um, so again, these changes were just approved um, in uh, at the end of last year. Um, so these are a few things that we as a city are, um, will be implementing throughout 2024. Um, and again, we will continue engagement um, with this body. Um, so the changes will take effect on January 1st, 2025. So we plan to do uh, many things before then, um, which includes training enforcement staff, updating our business and permits online licensing portal, um, which we are also planning some portal enhancements throughout this year to support um, new and existing businesses. Um, notifying, of course, license holders about upcoming changes. There'll be a few new requirements for noise control plans and patron management plans as part of this, um, as part of this framework. Um, so ensuring that operators and businesses are engaged in the development of those templates, making sure they're not too onerous, they're reflective of some of the products that are already developed um, um, by businesses in this sector particularly, and making sure that all of our information on city web pages and through 311 is updated um, according to the changes approved by council. Um, so I'll stop there on the licensing piece and I'll pass it back to Alok and Lauren. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch and Jamie. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Great, and so now we just want to talk a little bit about economic development and culture and what we plan uh, moving forward. So we did talk about how this was uh, an inaugural uh, Night Economy Town Hall. So moving forward, this will be taking place uh, on an annual basis. And it's uh, really an opportunity and a space for city, public, and industry to really stay connected. Uh, so look out for the next one in 2025. Uh, the Night Economy Review took place because of the work of member divisions of the internal working group, which still exists, and these relevant divisions will continue to work to address what we heard in the Night Economy Review, and also uh, we're planning on expanding the invite uh, to new members uh, of different divisions within the city, because one thing that we, uh, we certainly realize is that the Night Economy affects uh, the entire city and is citywide and touches upon many, many uh, different divisions. Uh, one thing that we're uh, going to also be doing this year is reconstituting the Night Economy External Working Group, and this will be created to facilitate further industry engagement, and the uh, Night Economy um, External Working Group will also uh, uh, have representation citywide, so not just from the downtown core by any means, and not just from uh, one particular part of the Night Economy, for instance, not just venue operators, but it'll uh, be very diverse. Uh, and, and representative uh, citywide, but also uh, of the industry itself. And uh, finally, uh, uh, there will be a focus will be placed uh, uh, on building a centralized communication channel, and this will enhance the distribution of the Good Neighbor Guide, which you'll hear more about, and other uh, valuable resources that the city provides. This enhanced communication will promote community building and awareness of citywide plans, such as SafeTO, our health and our city. And now over to Lauren, who will talk a bit more about the Good Neighbor Guide as well as what we heard at the town hall. Thanks so much, Alok. Uh, Lauren McCallum, she, her, Sector Development Officer for Visitor Economy Office. So uh, Alok, Jamie, and Mitch have given you some of the information that folks received at the Night Economy Town Hall based on the findings of the Night Economy Review. But it was also a bit of a sneak peek launch of a resource. Uh, so EDC took the information from the Night Economy Review, and we heard that people need guides. It's a tricky place to navigate all the permits and different things that happen. So this is 
is our way of trying to respond to that. So created by the Music Office and the Visitor Economy Office with input from all those various members of the internal working group, a digital version of this guide is going to be featured on the Night Economy webpage soon, so keep your uh, emails open for that notification. The guide will provide relevant information and links to resources that are intended to support operators in running a safe establishment that also benefits the surrounding community and includes nearby residents and other businesses in their considerations. By offering best practices not only from around the world, but sharing what's being done right here in Toronto, the Good Neighbour Guide for Late Night Businesses will assist late night establishments seeking to create safer spaces, safer working environments, encourage responsible consumption, and follow general good neighbour principles. Some of the topics that will be included in the guide are featured here on the screen from a preview of the table of contents. And for instance, in that minimizing sound and noise section, you're gonna find information about that noise bylaw that Mitch spoke to earlier, how you can measure that noise and sound, a little bit more detail about the noise exemption process, and learn more about the agent of change. Tips on parking and loading, crowd and line management, garbage and waste, and outdoor access to public washrooms would be discussed in areas like outside of your venue. Next slide, please. So in addition to us being able to share information and resources, the town hall is really an opportunity for us to engage with industry and community. We wanted to be able to hear what people thought about these changes and give them voice. So we decided to use Slido. Different presenters asked different questions and Mitch and Jamie presented some of the updated zoning and licensing regulatory changes that you just heard about. And we got to ask our group of about 300 people what they thought and what business owners and operators would take advantage of. You can see in the top right corner the number 75. That lets us know about the people in attendance at the town hall. About 75 of them identified as business owners or operators that would be impacted. The results were pretty split. You can see 28, 27, 24 between opening a live music space, opening a nightclub, or adding or expanding an entertainment area that could include live music, uh, with that last one being the highest. But all of these clearly showed that these regulatory changes are opening up opportunities for increased engagement with not only the night economy, but live music within the city. Next slide, please. The other great feature about Slido was the open Q&A. So yes, we could use this to get feedback about what people thought we were doing, but generally we just wanted to give a voice to participants. So throughout the entire duration of all of our presentations, folks were putting various questions into a Q&A. They could also review other people's questions and vote on the questions that they liked the most or that they thought were the most popular because we had let them know that we can actually answer 300 questions at the end of the night, but those that received the most votes would have city staff address them directly. Maybe no surprise to this group, the most popular question asked that received the most votes was related to live music. It's here on the screen, really simply, what is being done to address the war on live music? And then a little bit more there. And because Mike Tanner was present as a member of the internal working group, he was able to stand up and address that question. We received other questions about public transit, um, about c culture, about um, transportation generally, but the live music question received the most votes. So these are just some examples of the way that the town hall was able to share information, share resources, and allow industry and community to engage directly with city staff. Next slide. So as Alok mentioned, the Town Hall will be a reoccurring annual event because the work of the internal working group, external working group, and the night economy is ongoing. This night economy was specific to the work of the review, but in the review we heard there's lots more work to do and we're excited to take that on. If you want to follow along and learn about what we're doing related to the night economy, we've got uh, toronto.ca slash night economy. If you're more interested specifically in the regulatory changes you heard about from Mitch and Jamie and what that implementation process might look like, you can get right into that nitty gritty at night economy review. And if you just have some general questions or want to learn more about anything that you heard today, you can shoot us an email email at nighteconomy at toronto.ca. Thanks so much.
positive and uh, looking forward to the annual uh, meeting. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea for engagement. Um, Sorry, Mr. Chair, it's Councillor Ainsley online. I had a question about the Slido deck. Go ahead, thank you. Yep, um, so I just wanted to ask, um, during the night, the town hall, there was a number of um, questions from people in the audience, and I know they voted on them. Um, I was just wondering, as a, are all of those questions being consolidated and looked at and how are they getting answered or what, what are you doing with those questions? Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, in fact, we have consolidated all of the questions and they've each been divided into which division are most applicable and they've already been circulated and received by all of those divisions so they can take them into account. Our first uh, internal working group meeting will be March 7th and we'll be able to address the conversations around what work needs to be done in consideration of those. Okay. And is that the results of the... the conversations the internal working group is that coming back to this committee or how how do we learn about the process and how it's proceed, proceeding uh that's something that we can certainly talk to uh mike tanner about of maybe we do an annual report of uh what's happening uh, along the night economy and, uh, as opposed to at each tmac but i'll i'll let mike to speak to that um, yeah, th thanks for the question, Councillor Ernst. It's a good one. Um, there is already a pre-existing, um, I'm not sure if it's a requirement or suggestion or exactly how it's framed, but, but it's pre-existing for engagement between TMAC and the uh, working groups, internal and external. So there will already be um, considerable back and forth between uh, the working groups and and this committee as well uh, f for all the obvious reasons um, for for information for um, flow flow of ideas and opinions uh, as you've heard from um, from Mitch Tebow particularly there are going to be partic uh, specific occasions and and topics on which MLS wants to further engage with TMAC members, particularly in, in some of the uh, task teams as well. So um, we, can, we can work with um, the Night Economy team specifically on ensuring that, that this committee is kept apprised of, of how the questions are, are parceled out, how the answers and what the main sort of themes of communication are there. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I did it backwards. There we go. Um, he hearing no uh, further speakers, do I have a motion to receive the item? Jonathan, you want to go again? <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, our next item uh, is Toronto Culture and Economy Plans. Ben McIntosh and Adam, I'm gonna say did did it, did, did Ikes um, for Economic Development Culture will give a presentation to the committee. Please go ahead. I didn't even get close to your name, did I? Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us here this afternoon. Uh, really excited to talk to you today about uh, upcoming strategic plans that we're developing in the Economic Development Culture Division, uh, including the new Culture Plan, as well as our new Economic Development Plan. So uh, my name is Ben McIntosh, I'm Manager of Cultural Partnerships with uh, the Economic Development Culture Division. I'm joined here today by my colleague Adam. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Didich. I'm a Policy Development Officer in the Economic Development and Culture Division. 
Uh, so I'll begin with just a little overview of what these projects are all about. We're still very much in the early stages. So we, we're seeing this as an initial visit to the, the committee to introduce you to the work, talk a little bit about how we're engaging the community and going about the process. And we'll be coming back later on in the process once we have some recommendations to share with you all as well. So if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, we'll walk through the overview of the strategies and how we're engaging the community. We'll share a little bit about what we've heard so far. Uh, and also seek your input on, on the overall direction of where we're going with the, the process and uh, whether the, the key themes we're hearing so far uh, resonate with you based on your, your initial look. Uh, so there's three strategic planning processes currently underway in economic development culture. Uh, one of these is to develop the, the new culture plan. Its working title is Action Plan for Toronto's Culture Sector, but rest assured we'll come up with something really catchy by the end of it. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be a 10-year plan that sets out a renewed vision for how we support culture in the city. And that includes how we, the city and Toronto Arts Council support artists and arts organizations, uh, how we support creative industries in the city, uh, cultural heritage, and of course, uh, how people experience culture in the city. So we really want this to be a, a plan for everyone, whether you're an artist or a practicing creative, or whether you're just someone who's interested in culture and wants more opportunities to experience it in your neighborhood. Uh, alongside this, we're also developing a new economic development plan, which uh, again, pending, pending catchy title, uh, is currently the action plan for Toronto's economy. This is going to set out a 10-year plan to uh, look at Toronto's uh, uh, economic systems and how, how we could, the city can enhance the competitiveness of Toronto uh, while still maintaining a really important focus on inclusive economic development and making sure that uh, the city's economy provides er opportunities for everyone to, to participate and ha have uh, good, meaningful jobs. Uh, in addition, we're also developing an internal divisional strategy. So this is our, little, our strategic plan that's going to be a roadmap for how we implement all these things uh, together. But the main things we want to talk to you today about the, are the two public-facing strategies, the, the culture plan and the economic development plan. Uh, so in terms of the project timelines, uh, we've, we kicked this off uh, uh, earlier in 2023 with the, our preliminary, preliminary work and kicked off public engagement in uh, August of last year. So uh, th this is the engagement's happening uh, up until around April of this year. Uh, and it, concurrently, we're also working on actually developing the recommendations. So going through everything we've heard from, from the community uh, and using that to, to lay out uh, some, some draft directions for where we'll ultimately head. Uh, the final plans are, are currently scheduled to be presented to City Council for approval in September. Uh, so if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. Uh, so before we get into engagement, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit about for what, what the culture plan is about and you know, why are we doing this now. So the culture plan is going to be setting out a new 10-year vision for how we support culture in Toronto. It's been some time since we had our last culture plan. It was called Creative Capital Gains, and it was adopted by City Council in 2011. Obviously, a lot has changed in Toronto in, uh, since that time. Uh, and when you look at the goals of the, the previous culture plan, I think we can say a lot of the key actions in there were achieved. And there's also some really different objectives that we're, we're seeing as a city. Uh, I think the overall theme of Creative Capital Gains could be characterized as it really cementing Toronto's reputation as an international creative capital. And I think arguably we've gotten there. There's still, but there's some new challenges uh, and also some ongoing pressing ones that we still need to address through a renewed strategy. So uh, access to cultural space, for example, was a, it was already a priority in the last plan, but it remains a huge issue for the sector today. So how will we deal with this issue going forward? We're also talking about equity and inclusion in a completely different way than we did in 2011, and we need a new policy framework to really reflect this. Uh, so there's also, of course, a real moment coming out of the pandemic. There's been so much talk about how we can renew the sector, build back in a, a better way. Uh, so we really want to be able to leverage that energy uh, to create a visionary new policy for where we'll head in the future. Uh, so in terms of engagement for this plan and how we're going about it, so we've, uh, we're working with an amazing consulting group called Monumental Projects, who you may be familiar with. Uh, they're running a series of engagement that includes some really close uh, 
community conversations, which are sort of focus group style things, as well as a lot of bro broader public engagement. And uh, looking around the room today, I see at least two people who are at our, um, at our community conversations, and I think there are a few more based on the online list. So uh, we're really happy to have some vo really strong voices from the music sector present. Uh, but in terms of the, the community conversation, so these were eight sessions that we did that focused on specific themes. Uh, the first three were held with uh, commu uh, specific communities. So we held one with uh, indigenous artists and creatives, one with black artists and creatives, and one with uh, artists and creatives who are, are, are deaf and have disabilities. We wanted to make sure we held these uh, community-specific engagements first to be able to use their insights to help frame all of the work we did and make sure we're, we're really approaching it from an inclusive and equitable way. The other community conversations were focused on specific themes that we knew were, were new of interest to the sector. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier, creative space is a huge issue in the sector. No surprise to anyone again. But uh, we ended up doing two uh, community conversations about that just because there was so much to talk about. We also held a session about the impact of creative technology on arts and culture work. Uh, and we also held one that was really about sort of big dreaming for the future. We called it Arts and Culture as a Catalyst for Change. Uh, lastly, we also had a session uh, exploring the ongoing recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and the continued impacts on arts organizations and cultural work uh, and what some of the strategies are that the city can under undertake to support people in recovering from that. Uh, in addition, we have also held uh, artist-led engagement sessions. And these were some really fun events where we, we hired five artists who we worked in different neighborhoods across the city. They were given a fairly high-level brief of, you know, we want to get feedback from people about how they experience culture in their neighborhood and how they want to do it in the future. They were then invited to design a, an engagement activity uh, that they felt would be relevant for their communities. So, uh, one, we had an artist who did a, a weaving workshop with her community that included a, a discussion about uh, challenges facing practicing artists. We had another one who did tours of uh, murals in the, the Bickford Park neighborhood um, and also used that as an opportunity to, to seek feedback about uh, practicing artists working with the city and how we can better support them. So we got, we got a lot of really interesting feedback from those sessions and also from people who aren't normally engaged in city consultations. So uh, I think overall it was a, a successful strategy to expand the reach of what we've been doing consultation-wise. We also have opportunities for absolutely anybody to get involved. So uh, we're holding two virtual town halls, the first of which is tonight. So if it's still time to register if you'd like, but it's at uh, 6.30. And we have another one uh, next week on the 22nd. Uh, in addition, there's a online survey where anyone can provide their feedback as well. Uh, at the end of this process, we're going to take a look at everybody who participated, and if there's any gaps, we're going to be holding additional sessions to make sure we capture appropriate feedback. So, for example, if we see the list of participants and there's not quite enough from the music industry, we're definitely going to be doing follow-up uh, workshops led by staff to make sure that we're, we're getting those perspectives incorporated. I already know that uh, Mike, Marguerite, and the team are planning a session with Creative Industries at the start of March. Uh, lastly, we also have an external advisory panel who are providing advice on the project. Uh, and one of your own is represented there. Thank you, Amer, for all your support on this. Uh, but that panel includes 20 uh, community leaders from various sectors and communities who are helping to provide advice on the shape of the plan. I'll hand it over to Adam now, who will chat a little bit about how we've been engaging on the economic development plan. Thanks, Ben. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. Okay, perfect. Uh, so in terms of engagement, the action plan for Toronto's economy has three general engagement touch points. Uh, first, through an economic advisory panel, second, through a public survey, and third, through dedicated sector-specific public engagement sessions, um, the latter of which are largely being supported by our consultant, the Canadian Urban Institute. In terms of the economic advisory panel, the panel is made up of 26 industry leaders and subject matter experts across different Toronto-focused organizations uh, who have provided advice from a variety of different subject matter perspectives. A public survey was launched approximately two and a half weeks ago uh, and is currently live on two City of Toronto websites, the Have Your Say webpage and the Action Plan for Toronto's Economy uh, uh, landing page. Um, and so the survey actually gives the public an opportunity to provide feedback that can then inform the development of the action plan for Toronto's economy. Dedicated public engagement sessions continue to provide insight from a wide variety of small business owners, uh, business associations, and cultural organizations uh, to also provide feedback to inform the development of the action plan for Toronto's economy. 
Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ben, who will provide an overview of our further engagement and what we've heard from engagement to date. Over to you. Yes, next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we're going to be coming back to the uh, Music Advisory Committee uh, a little later on in the process to share our recommendations. But we're also visiting a number of other council advisory committees to seek feedback. So that include the 2SLGBTQ Plus Committee, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Committee, uh, and in addition, we will also be making uh, presentations to the Indigenous Affairs Committee and the Film Board. I want to share a little bit about what we've heard so far. I know this is very high-level stuff, really consolidated across like, all the different sectors, so I'll try to tie it into what we've heard as well about the music industry as we go through this. Uh, but to start out, very, very clear message that the lack of affordable, accessible space for culture is a top need across all different disciplines of culture and creative industries. And you know, when it comes to, to music, we've heard so much, obviously, around the challenges facing live music venues over the past several years. Uh, but it, in addition, we're also hearing a lot about the pr pressures facing rehearsal spaces. So not sufficient rehearsal spaces uh, in terms of availability, um, incentives to keep them going. So there, there's a real need to, I think, be strategic about how we support the full ecosystem of, of the music sector in, in terms of space needs. We've also heard about uh, a lot about the distribution of cultural funding uh, through current systems, and that it, it feels inequitable to a lot of folks. Uh, when you look at the patterns of how city funding has been distributed over the years, there's a real concentration among uh, large cultural institutions, also often in the downtown core, while newer emerging organizations may not have access to the same level of resources. So there's been uh, a lot of encouragement uh, to the City and the Toronto Arts Council to look at how we can uh, modernize the funding systems to ensure that uh, the next generation of, of culture really has access to the resources they need to, to scale and thrive. Uh, this also included uh, comments around the distribution of cultural programming across the city, a real continued interest in making sure that uh, all residents have access to high quality cultural programming close to where they live and all year round. Uh, transportation uh, is not surprisingly coming up as a big issue as well, and while not immediately within the scope of a culture plan or economic development plan, it is so connected to the work we do, and we have to really, like, Culture and the economy are linked to so many aspects of city infrastructure that we really need to think holistically about how we, we leverage all the different parts of city building to support uh, the economy and culture. Uh, increased activations in winter and fall months, again, a, a real interest in having uh, things to do in the city all year round related to culture, uh, a need for greater supports related to emerging tech and creative practices. And I'm sure this is one where I think we can really dig in with the members of the committee at our, our future meetings about some of the ways that we can consider how the city in, uh, interacts with and sets policies related to, to technology that's impacting the music sector. We've also heard about the need for greater research and impact measures. Uh, we actually have a great partnership underway right now with the University of Toronto to build a new set of outcome measures uh, that we're going to use to measure the impact of this plan, uh, which we'll be excited to share with you at our next meeting as well. Uh, and lastly, in closing, there's really been a desire for a lot of connection, community building, uh, mentorship programs, career uh, capacity building. Uh, we're hearing a lot about the, how culture and the economy really contribute to community in the city. And a feeling of coming out of the pandemic where folks are still feeling a bit isolated. And what can we do to leverage culture to, to bring people together in a better way? So. Uh, We've been tasked with some really interesting and challenging ideas and are looking forward to working with, with you and many other partners to, to build out some concrete recommendations for how the city can advance all, all these areas and more. So uh, we'll open it up to the group for any questions or, or comments you may have. Um, any thoughts you have as well on the sort of initial feedback of what we heard and whether those challenges and issues resonate and if there's anything missing or any questions you have around the overall process. Fantastic. Thanks for the presentation. Um, any questions? Uh, th thanks, uh, Ben. Thanks, Adam. Um, 
And, and sorry we kept you waiting. This meeting's gone a little longer than, than we thought it would, but there was some pretty robust discussion on, on the first item. Um, I, you know that we have um, made some suggestions for the, I think, the advisory on, on the culture plan initially, and I, and I think you've incorporated some of the suggestions. My question was, um, would the survey closing, I think one closes March 3rd, and one closes the end of this month? Uh, is there something that we, music office, TMAC members, can do to help broaden and deepen the reach of those survey responses, or are you good? We're always happy to have more help in spreading the word, so uh, we can share messages through, through you that we could uh, share with the members and they can help to broadcast through social media. We're having a really great take-up so far, but uh, the more the merrier. Okay, that, that, that would be great. I think um, the, the TMAC is uh, made up of all these different representations from different parts of the industry, and they're all kind of avatars and, and vehicles for communication into different parts of the music community as well. Um, so, so we can rely on them to help spread the, the word around. Um, and then the other question I had really quickly was, will there be further opportunity for, like when, I think you mentioned to me, Ben, when we were talking about this, that, that maybe uh, there'll be some results to share um, like May-ish by the time of the next meeting. For sure, yes. Yeah. So we are planning to come back to the, the Music Advisory Committee once we have draft recommendations in place to seek your feedback on those directions. Uh, and for the culture plan as well, we are going to be putting out a public report that anyone can provide impact on, it, uh, not impacts, or <laughs> comments on. Um, so yes, yeah, so there will be lots of opportunities to engage further in developing the plan. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, would anyone like to speak to the item? Excellent. Well, thank you for your presentation. It's fantastic. And we look forward to further engagement. Um, hearing no further speakers, do I have a motion to receive the item? I'm skipping something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting too testy with the button here. Sorry, who? Oh, there we go. Omer, uh, great, thank you. Um, item, item has been received. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried. Okay, so the next, uh, next, I think this is our final item. Yes, yes. Uh, um, is a meeting schedule 2024. Mike Tanner, Program Manager, Music Sector Development, Economic Development and Culture, will discuss yeah. 2024 committee meeting dates. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not going to discuss anything. Rather, I'm just going to suggest these. Um, this is a Rubik's Cube of the ninth level of some kind of scheduling hell, folks, uh, trying to get clerks uh, availability of committee rooms, the councillors, two of whom are deputy mayors with very busy schedules, um, and uh, of course, most importantly, all of the industry members. You know, so, so Jacqueline and I work pretty hard to try to find dates uh, that do not conflict in a huge way with major industry events and also uh, fit the um, you know, ever-shifting requirements of, of, of council and councillors and availability here. So if we can put those on the, on the screen, Jonathan, that would be easier than me rattling off dates. So uh, we've made a few changes from the dates that were initially proposed and approved uh, last November. Um, we hope that they suit uh, everybody here. Um, but we're going to find out in a second once they're up on the screen. And I feel since we've had a few people drop off and had to leave, uh, we're going to maybe just do a proactive sending around of these dates again just to double check that they're in everybody's schedules, including the councillors. Um, so here we are. Uh, the next one, February, or, or sorry, May 14th, moves to May 10th. That is a Friday, which we don't ideally like to do, but uh, it's not going into a long weekend or anything. And 1:30, ideally, we get out here by 3:30. September 24th stays on September 24th, but it moves to a 2 p.m. start. And the November meeting moves simply from Wednesday, November 20th to Thursday, November 24th, and it's at 10 a.m. 
I hope that works for everybody. I hope to God it works for everybody. You said 24, but you meant 21st. I did. Okay. Sorry, 2024. Babbling. I mean, I guess we vote on this, right? Uh, do we move? Uh, yeah, you can move it. Okay. So, so uh, this is to move the, to amend the 24-24 uh, schedule to the dates that Mike had mentioned. Um, all in favor? Yes. Anyone opposed? Moved. Um, and we will share these online and yes, confirm again. Yeah, and we'll yeah. Um, and we good there? Before you can do it. before adjournment. Um, with the Toronto Music Advisory Committee, excuse the absence of Amy Therian, uh, Paul Banwatt, Hila Omakel, uh, and Tracy Jenkins from the February 15th, 2024 meeting of the Toronto Music Advisory Committee. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Most passed. That concludes our business for today. Thank you, members, staff, presenters. The meeting is now adjourned. Thanks, everybody.